No. No. Ah! Hi, this is Dale Lear, designer of TRS-80 Color Baseball, and you're listening to Coco Talk. This is Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Calore computer. It's time to drop your socks. Grab your real-time clocks, and let's rock. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the Tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. Hello, doing fine. Glad to be here. I'm pretty good. Howdy, everyone. Game on, people. Sound is not going out. Uh, getting a lot of reports. Sound is not going out. No, everybody but you is going out from the sounds of it. Well, that's okay then, right? How do you even do that? <laughs> Testies one, two. Testies we can one, translate two. for him. Okay. Can you guys hear my mic now? I can hear it. Well, you guys uh, can hear it, but it wasn't in the time. stream. Okay. There we go. Mm-hmm. Everyone's saying he's back. There we yep, go. Now I can, I can see the little VMU meter. Yeah, they're saying they got it now. <clears throat> okay. Anyways, that is what it is. So anyways, we're going around the room, right? The last person we were talking about was Grant Leedy, the Coco Fest organizer. How you doing, Grant Leedy? Grant's muted. Okay, now I'm back. No, I was just saying, I guess the big news for Coco Fest later in the show. Be glad to share that with you guys. Big news for Coco Fest later in the show. Stay tuned, folks. Film at 11. All right, Alan Murphy is here. How you doing, Alan? Doing all right. Howdy, howdy, Coco Nuts. Howdy, howdy. He's got a garage. He's in Arizona. It's Ron Delvo. How are you, Ron? Dave's here, man. Yes, our foreign correspondent and news anchor from O Canada, L. Curtis Boyle is there. Hey, Curtis. Welcome, everyone. Excuse me. Our second Canadian on the show and our host of our Game On segment, Ken Waters, a.k.a. Canadian Retro Things. How's it going, eh? It's going good, eh? Hey, it's a beauty, eh? Take off, eh? Yeah. (laughs) We have the guy whose game we played this week, and I believe he probably got three or four Ferraris from the sales of that this week. The Thunder from Down Under, Nicholas Morantes. Good eye, Nick. Good eye, everyone. Then we got some putts named Terry Steggier. Hey, Terry, how you doing? 
Yeah, what do you do? <laughs> wow. All right. So Love. we just introduced our regular panel. We are now going to get to meet our special guest of the week this week. We're going to play Get to Know David Lent. David Lent, this is your life, by the way, your third grade uh, teacher. We have her. She's backstage. She'll come out later on and talk about all the inappropriate things you did with crayons. <laughs> um, so welcome to the program. David Lent, how are you, sir? Oh, real good. How are you doing, Steve? Good. Um, is there any special information you want to share with the world that might have just happened in your world recently? Oh, well, I just had uh, my first child. Her name's Lindy. She was born on uh, December 12th. We had to stay in the hospital for five days because uh, my wife was having blood pressure issues. So I, I stayed there with them and I had to sleep on this very uncomfortable couch in the hotel or not hotel uh, hospital room. Oh, well, you, your first child. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yep. There. Thank you. If my soundboard's working this. There we go. There we go. Technical difficulties. So yeah, I um we were at VCF Midwest, but we didn't know we were there together because our paths did not cross. But I saw you had done a video from your tour at VCF Midwest. We met at Coco Fest. You were there, uh, so that's how I kind of got to meet you and find out about you doing YouTube and stuff like that. So I'm glad you could join us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you did back in the day? Like what was your, what what was what was your first computer? Why did you get into computers? What did you love? What did you do? All those kinds. Oh, okay. Well, well, I was nine years old and I wanted a computer and I only had like a, a small amount of money. So I decided just to buy an Atari 2600. So I bought it and I brought it home and hooked it up to the TV and it wouldn't work because my parents had some color TV that was so old that it, it just didn't work with uh, any kind of video game system. So I returned the Atari and kept the money and I got a paper route, and for two years, I delivered newspapers until I had enough money to buy a computer. Uh, I got a TRS-80 Color Computer 2 with 64K of RAM. The reason I got a Color Computer is because my mom, uh, when I was bugging her that I wanted to learn about computers, she brought me to Radio Shack, and they had some class where they taught uh, little kids logo. So I learned logo on a Color Computer. So that's why I ended up getting one, because I figured I, I already know how to use it, so I might as well get one. But my first game was Monster Maze, which uh, doesn't hold up well in, in today's terms. But back then, I, I thought it was fun. And then I got Stellar Lifeline, which was one of my favorite games for the uh, TRS-80. And I had like Mega Bug, Dungeons of Daggerith. Uh, Puyin was my favorite. It was on a cassette tape. And I, I didn't have a disk drive. I just had a tape recorder for it. But I like I also like to go to like newspapers and, and magazines and stuff and get the little code clippings and basic and type them in and save them on tape and stuff. My favorite was one. I think it might have been in the Chicago Tribune. It was called Color Racer, where you had like a little race car and you used the I, I don't know if it was the arrow keys or what to move left and right. And as you were going, the track would kind of turn and get smaller and smaller until you couldn't go anymore but i thought it was really cool for a basic program so anyhow later on after i had that color computer for a few years the price of the commodore 64 went down there one of the reasons uh i didn't get a commodore 64 before is because they were 600 at the time but three years later they're only 150 bucks so i ended up buying one of those in a disk drive and played a lot of games on it because my friends and I would all uh, trade games back and forth and stuff. So I had a good time with that. That one, I, d I didn't have as much fun with it. I mean, I had fun with the games, but I didn't like the basic on it because the basic wasn't as good on the as on the TRS-80. So you had to do all those uh, peek and pokes and stuff, uh, which at the time I didn't like. So anyhow, uh, fast forward to the future, I end up getting a degree in computer engineering. I work as a senior software engineer at Motorola. Uh, right now, computers I use are a, a Mac Mini, which I love with an M1 chip. That thing is just awesome. And then I have a gaming laptop from HP, which is what I'm using right now. Uh, that's a good computer, too. And as far as the YouTube, uh, how I got into that. I, I, I have actually two YouTube channels. The other one is Centurion's Review, which is a war game review magazine, or not magazine, YouTube channel. 
Uh, it's about hex and shit uh, board games. I, I mostly cover vintage ones. And as far as computer hobbyists, I'm doing videos on there about mono game, which is a framework you use to build a, a video game engines using the .NET programming language or C sharp, which is uh, one of the family of .NET programming languages. And let's see what I'm also doing a few hardware reviews on that channel. And the channel's just kind of is really new and it's just kind of trying to find its way so far. Where you live, Dave? I live in uh, Pingree Grove, Illinois. Uh, it's about five miles west of Elgin. I'm about an hour from Chicago, hour west. Yeah, Coco Fest used to be in Elgin actually years back. So, Oh, nice. I have a quick question for you. You, you said you have one challenge devoted to, to war games and stuff. Um, do you cover some of the old retro computer war games? Because the Coco was actually particularly strong in that there was a company called Arc Royal Games. And that's pretty well all they did. And they had dozens of them. I've been thinking about doing it. Uh, if, if I do cover those, I'm going to cover them on computer hobbyists instead of the board game channel. But yeah, there's also a lot of old Avalon Hill made some great uh, vintage yeah. board games and they also had some great uh, software back in the day too. So I was thinking about doing some videos on some of those because some of those are actually pretty good. The only problem is uh, when you bought them, they included a map which had like grid coordinates for each uh, hex or square on the map. And if you just get a hold of the software, you won't have the map, so you can't play the game unless you have the original version. That's the only thing holding me back, really. So I got to get a hold of the uh, original versions in order to review those. Okay, yeah, because I know the archive's got a few, like uh, I'll take one that's from Avalon Hill, actually, VC, Vietcon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a graphical one on the Coco 1 and 2 back from about 82, 83. Um, so that one, I think the manual might even be on the archive. And I know some of the Arc Royal ones do have the manuals in there, and some of them are kind of like, fancy tech space on our high res nice I'm ready i'll look into those yeah i got a few of them on my website to my games website i don't have all of them i'm still going through them all but uh i don't really have the time to learn more games either so if you already have a background in that it'd be awesome maybe you can help me write some of the descriptions a bit better than i'm doing yeah no problem cool cool yeah um yeah on the um a lot of archive sites where you can get your disc images have Color Computer Archive has got a lot of that where you can get the disc image and things for certain adventure games, walkthroughs, or created maps and stuff like that. So sometimes there's some community contributed stuff you can find there on, on the different archive sites too, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so you, because you're in the is that I'm just curious, like because you were at VCF Midwest and Cocoa Fest, but they're both kind of in your backyard. Is, what got you into going to these festivals and stuff too? How'd you learn about them? How long you been doing those things? Well, I, I go to a lot of war game conventions and I figured since I've been to computers, I'd start looking up some computer conventions. And I saw that there is ones related to uh, vintage computing, which uh, I, I always liked. I mean, I use DOS box and stuff to play old DOS games. And then I use emulators to play Commodore pet games and stuff and Commodore 64 games. And uh, uh, TRS-80 stuff too. So I, when I heard there's a, vintage conventions i was like yeah this is something right up my alley so I, I went to a vintage computer festival midwest and brought my camera and uh videotaped the whole uh dealers area and stuff and posted a video i had a real good time there the 8-bit guy was there uh computer clan was there and lgr was there too and uh, i watched their little presentation that they put on the 8-bit guy had a presentation on uh uh, demos, uh, which, which was really cool. I had no idea there was an actual demo scene in the retro community, so that was fun to watch. And then uh, when I went to Coco Fest, uh, I really liked the presentations that were there too. Those were fun to watch. Cool stuff. Yeah. How many is it? Was this your first year of attending those, or have you been to ones in the past? Oh, uh, th this was the first year. Okay. And you got both. How long of those? have you been going to? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. Go ahead, Curtis. Uh I was just going to ask, uh, how long have you been going to the Warm Game conventions? Because it sounds like oh, that's a bit more historical for you. I, I've been going to those since I was a little kid. My dad's into war gaming too. So um, there's several like Little Wars and Rock Con I go to every year and uh, Wolf Con. So those three I go to every year. And then occasionally there's some uh, smaller ones that pop up that I'll go to. So yeah, I really like going to conventions and stuff. Now, are those I'm not familiar with those shows because I'm not into to war games that heavily, but uh, is that something also local to Chicago or do you have to travel around the country? To go oh, to those? Th th those are local too. like Little Wars is in uh, uh, Lombard and Rock Con is in uh, Rockford, Illinois, and then Wolf Con is in Chicago. Okay, 
It seems like Poker Fest has also been in Lombard. But... Chicago's <laughs> the place to be for for events, man. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of board games, I, I was always in love with uh, Stratego when I was growing up. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, love that game. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'll just plug something real quick. Uh, nobody else will see it, but you guys can see it. Um, I'll show this off of my updates and in, in acquisitions, but I got a reproduction of a board game I had back in the day that was called Dungeon from TSR Hobbies. Oh, and nice. It was kind of like uh, training wheels versions of Dungeons and Dragons. You, you roll dice, you move pawns around the dungeon board like a board game and fought monsters, got treasures and stuff. And I, I, I had that game as a kid and I found it uh, found a, a modern reproduction of it now uh, that I went ahead and grabbed which is kind of cool um, so that's even more basic than basic d and yeah yeah it's it's <laughs> it is like roll the dice and move your pawn four spaces and pull a monster card and roll the dice to see if you if you win or lose things like that so yeah cool now, one, one thing I wanted to ask you uh, David you're you said you're an engineer at Motorola, software engineer at Motorola. So do you actually do any games programming for the retro machines as well? Or? Uh, not for retro, no, just for modern. Uh, all the games I've made just uh, run on either Windows, Macintosh, or their web-based games. So I, I haven't done any retro stuff. I'd like to, though, because one thing that's cool about the retro stuff is your programming so close to the hardware. So I, I've always had an interest in that. The only assembly language programming I did was when I was in college, though. I, I never did any afterwards, unfortunately. Okay. What kind of games are you making? Uh, two of them were Hex and Shit uh, war games uh, uh, that I just uh, uh, made into a video game. And then uh, I did a Space Invaders clone. And I don't know if you guys remember from the old Amiga 500, there's a game called Daleks. Uh, I, I made a version of that for .NET 1.0. And right now I'm working on one called Worldwide Pandemic. That one I don't like so much. That, that would be done pretty soon, but uh, it's not my best work. But uh, I'm planning on doing a real big game in about 12 weeks hmm. because uh my, my wife's taking 12 weeks of paternity leave and then afterwards i'm going to take 12 weeks too and during that 12 weeks uh i, I want to make a game so that one will be a world war ii game kind of like avalon hill S squad leader that's neat so it seems there's a common theme there in uh, yep. the kind of stuff that you like to make yeah, yeah. is yeah. your pandemic a game or is that a documentary uh it's just a <laughs> game <laughs> It plays kind of like a board game. Uh, it was one of those things where when you think of it in your mind, you're like, oh, this makes perfect sense. and It's going to be awesome. And then when you actually implement it, you're like, well, this isn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. Wow. It's like the real thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, just real quick. There were some people in the live chat saying my audio was cutting in and out. Has that audio gotten any better? Because I was using some filters on my uh, mic in OBS that I've turned off. So. Anybody who said my my audio was cutting in and out, let me know if that audio is any better. Um, yeah, because you weren't cutting out in here, so yeah, yeah no, I think, it, I think it, it had to have been in the stream, which means it was going through uh, OBS. Um, and I tried to put in a noise reduction filter to, to kind of cut down on some of the noise of my laptop fan that I'm talking on. Um, cool. Well, so you're making games, which is cool. Jim Rice is better. Yeah. And you have a YouTube channel now. Uh, do you do anything with retro systems now? Do you play with Cocos and emulators, or you have a real Coco, or any any real retro <laughs> hardware that you play with? Uh, everything I do pretty much is in emulators. Uh, like uh, the one I use a lot is Vice, where I uh, emulate the PET and the Commodore 64 and the Commodore uh, 128. And then I have a uh, emulator for a TRS-80. That one's a, a, a Windows-based emulator. The, the other ones I use on my Mac. And my wife and I have some little, I don't know what you call these things. I got them on eBay for like $20 each. They're little handheld video games. And one is like a Atari 2600 emulator. And it's got like, I don't know, 50 games on it or something. Mm -hmm. You can play it uh, on the little uh, uh the, the little game pad it has with the screen on it, or you can connect it to the TV set and play it on your TV. So that's pretty cool. And I have one of those for the Sega Genesis too, which has, I don't know, a hundred games on it. Right. Right. Like the at games where it looks like a little console type thing and you plug it yeah. into the TV. Yeah. And then I got one for the Nintendo entertainment system. Uh, that one's got about 50 or 60 games, but the problem is that it doesn't have Super Mario Brothers. And I mean, come on, everyone who plays uh, Nintendo wants to play Mario Brothers, so I'm surprised it didn't have that one on it. Uh, yeah, so the modern, uh, with the kind of the all-in-one type game systems, the plug-and-play game systems, they call those things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, those are cool. Those are, those are easy. Like, I have 
the Commodore 64 Mini. I actually haven't played with it yet, but somebody gave me that one as a gift, and you can just kind of plug it in with an HDMI cable and plug in a USB joystick and play some games that are built into it. Um, yeah, something you might want to play with is setting up a Cocoa Pi. If you can get a Raspberry Pi 4 or Raspberry Pi 400, we've got an image you can load on an SD card and emulate all kinds of Cocoa systems and download software to it, play Cocos right on a, on a Raspberry Pi, and it's an inexpensive way. Um, not only with that, but the Raspberry Pi, there's all kinds of other emulation images you can get, like uh, uh, the RetroPie and Emulation Station and things like that. So a lot of people will use a Raspberry Pi as a multi-purpose emulator. You know. So is a Raspberry Pi, is that the one that's just the board, or is it the one where it's a keyboard? Well, there's different ones. The Raspberry Pi in itself is a single board computer, and there's somewhere you put them in a little plastic case, you buy your own case and hook up your own ones. But the Raspberry Pi 400 um, is built into a keyboard. Yeah, that's pretty neat because I think that's only like $120, it's $120 or something. Bucks, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's yeah. very reasonable. Yeah, I just got one recently. I like it. It's neat. As a matter of fact, I'm teaching a class at night with Network Plus, and I actually showed my students how I could SSH into it and do some Linux commands and a command prompt cool. on, on Linux through this uh, uh, Raspberry Pi. So, is, is that what uh, the operating system built into it is uh, Linux? It, or? it is its own version of Linux. It's the Ras Raspberry Pi OS, which is it used to be called Raspbian because it was based on Debian, and and now it's mm -hmm. called Raspberry Pi OS. I'm not sure what it's still based on, but it is a Linux. It's a flavor of Linux on it. Yeah, I, I think it's still a Debian distribution, but there's okay. also Ubuntu one, and Microsoft has a Windows 10 for it. Not that it's that good. Uh, Windows 10 for Raspberry Pi, or an ARM-based yeah. Windows 10. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay, interesting. It's yeah. not very good, though. <laughs> yeah, but a Pi 400 is an inexpensive toy that you can emulate a ton of stuff on. You know? What uh, video output does it have? Does it have a HDMI? Or yeah, it, it, has, yes. it has two and HDMIs. It has, and so, composite. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, it's a neat little thing. And there's an image you can download. Are you on our Discord server by any chance? We'll no, to... I'm not. Uh, I should join, though, I think. Yeah, yeah. So we have a channel for that where you, where you can we have discussions on different products and projects and platforms and stuff. Um, no, it's neat. So we won't take up too much time plugging that project. But that's just something that uh, if you're interested in experiencing a lot of different Cocos and MC10s and Dragon computers and downloading mm -hmm. software straight from the Internet to the system and it's all menu driven, it's pretty cool. It's a cool way yeah. to the whole Coco nice. Pie project too. It has various emulators. It has MAME and XROAR and a few other things you can emulate. Yeah. You know, MC tens, Coco one two threes, Dragons. So yeah, it's a neat way to play with it. Uh, so what else is going on? Anything you want to plug? Do you have any um, videos coming out on your channel soon? You want to tell us or tease us about or anything like that? Yeah, the, the next one is coming out probably in uh, two weeks. Uh, is one on a thirty dollar. Uh, Chromebook. Basically, I was on Facebook and some guy was selling a Chromebook for thirty dollars, and he claimed it worked. And I was like, "All right, for thirty dollars, I'll buy it." I, I didn't actually need a Chromebook, but I can't <laughs> resist buying a thirty dollars computer. <laughs> so I, I went over there and he started it up, and it worked and stuff. And he had it set the factory settings, and I was like, "All right, I'll take it." So I gave him the thirty bucks, and it, it it's interesting. I, the internet's uh, slower than, as you can imagine, than on a, a good computer, but it, it's usable. Uh, and you can do email on it and stuff too. But the only problem is since it's such an old uh, Chromebook, you can't use the Google Play Store with it. So mm. the only apps you can get are apps for uh, the Chrome browser. That's right. it. You can't get Chrome actual apps. desktop uh, apps. So basically the video is going to be about whether or not uh, buying a $30 uh, Chromebook like this is useful or not. Uh, the <laughs> quick answer is, yeah, it's it, it's something that's good for grandma. Like if you, if grandma doesn't know how to use a computer and uh, you just she just wants to use email and uh, the internet and maybe watch a YouTube video, you can create a, uh, a Gmail account for her and buy, buy her one of these $30 uh, used computers and get her set up. And it'd probably be good enough for grandma. For, for most users, it, it, it they would end up wanting more, but for like grammar or someone who doesn't know anything about computers, it's probably not a bad idea. Which model of Chromebook is it? I can't remember the model name. I think it was, it is from a while ago. I think it's like from 2000. God, I, I'm sorry. I can't think, remember the, the data. Well, that's kind of like, it's, it's like saying if you buy an old iPad too, if you buy an old iPad and you can't get the latest iOS for it, you're never going to get the newest apps and stuff too. Right. So while, yep. while it works and it's something that has purpose and function, 
it's still kind of frozen in time with what you can do with it. And uh, yeah, I, yeah. I had an iPad too, and I loved it. That was a great tablet. But the problem is after I owned it long enough, uh, basically there was no, no longer any software for it on the app store. So I had to end up getting rid of it. So a lot of people now are going out and buying like uh, iPad ones. I mean, that, that's fine to buy if you're like in the retro computing and you just <laughs> yeah, want it for nostalgia. scary that an iPad one <laughs> an is iPad's almost retro, like vintage tech at this point. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, it, 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 it's good for like nostalgia, something like an iPad one or an iPad two. But uh, if you're you want to actually actually do anything, well, there's not much you can do with it. I mean, you can surf the web, but it, it doesn't even run the latest version of Safari. Safari or Chrome or anything, so there that's was, a problem. Uh, you just reminded me of an old time in, in uh, tablet history. But yeah, when the first iPad came out, the early days of tablets, and 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 Apple was notorious from day one. We're not going to support Flash, right? Flash is the devil. We're not going to mm -hmm. run Flash. And at that time, almost any video on the web needed Flash. And so I had inherited I think you, from somebody. Your audio stopped, Steve. His video stopped too. <laughs> My audio and video stopped. Oh, Hopefully. Steve's never looked better. All right. Are you guys there now? Hello, hello? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we can see you now. Okay. I just got a message saying that my internet was unstable. Uh, yeah, okay. It did. It actually froze dead it for a few seconds. very to totally dead. Yeah, okay. Looks like my streaming is back up. I've, I had my, yeah, I had... Yeah, so I'm using an experimental setup here, which uh, <laughs> so far is, uh, it's working for the most part, right? But yeah, what I was saying was like, I, I remember when the old days of the iPads came out and they wouldn't do flash and a lot of the early um, web videos were all flash based. So you couldn't look at any video on an old iPad. Somebody had given me a, a Nook that was Barnes and Nobles type thing, which is their semi ebook reader based on Android. But um, it, it did have the flash player, so I could actually go to websites, open it up, and look at videos on that little tablet. That was a, a workaround for the iPad limitation at some weird point in history. So, Actually, when your video froze up, Steve is about to ask, are you trying to log in with flash on an iPad? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so that's uh, cool. David, oh, sorry. Yes. Dave, you may want to consider looking into Chromium OS. It's what I run on my Chromebook, and once I installed it, it worked quite well. Oh, that's good. Um, it's what I have an I have an old uh, Dell uh, Chromebook, and I use it for emulation when I'm when I'm not at home. I uh, have the XROAR emulator and uh, OVCC on it, and it runs uh, pretty good. That's good. So OVCC is a, a cross-platform uh, Cocoa Three emulator. XR Online also works for that kind of stuff too, and does all, all the Cocos Dragons and MC10. So it's a still work in progress so for the local. recent release. So you mentioned at VCF Midwest, you like seeing the the famous YouTube guys. Uh, what was there anything else there that you saw that you did you see the Coco Corner that we had when you first walked into that? Yeah, it, actually, I did. Yeah, I did see you there though. You must have not been at the booth or something. Um. You, but did you, there was another celebrity there that you didn't mention, uh, Coco Man from CocoMan.biz. Did you happen to see him in his booth? Yeah, I saw his booth. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's gonna make sure we get we get uh, all the props where all these celebrities deserve it. So. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, one thing I'd like to see in the future at uh, um, BCFF, or, excuse me, uh, Vintage Computer Festival, yeah, is some Amigas. I noticed. There's computers of all types there, but there's no Amigas, which surprised me. Hmm. Uh, well, you did a walkthrough video there too, right? I mean, I took a bunch of pictures. You don't remember seeing any Amigas there this year? No, no. I, I videoed literally every computer that was on display um, in the dealer's area, and no one had a Amiga. I was surprised. Hmm. Interesting. That surprises me too, because I'm sure I've seen yeah, there Yeah, I remember seeing a lot of it. I remember one corner, there's a whole bunch of silicon graphics systems in there that was kind of cool. Yeah. And um, It's amazing. Those you can get for a few hundred dollars now, but like when I use silicon graphics uh, uh, workstations when I was in college, those were like $30,000 computers. <laughs> yeah, now you can buy them cheaper than a Coco 3. Yep. Yeah, right. So that is something. Um, yeah, there was I, some I have a question. Go I have ahead, a couple of questions uh, related to your, your Motorola stuff. So are you working at the Motorola? I, I think it was in Schaumburg. Is that still where? I, I used to work at that one. I'm working in the one in Elgin now. Okay. Because um, we had a guest at one of the Cocoa Fest recently. Steve, you remember the Steve? I'm trying to remember his last name. It had the laser display. Moskowitz. 
Moskowitz. Did you know him at the time? Or? The, the last name sounds familiar. I don't think I met him, but I might have seen the name somewhere. That sounds very familiar. Yeah, because he was he was re just retiring and he had a whole bunch of old Coco ones that he'd custom made this laser display to control lasers to draw shapes and patterns on walls and do an animated cool. display. You could see the planetarium. He actually gave away all that system stuff when he retired. So at the fest. Cool stuff. Um, yeah. So what about Coco Fest? Was this your first Coco Fest this year? Yeah. Yeah. I had a good time. I really liked the presentations. What about the Nitrous 9 presentation? What did you think about that one? That was interesting. I Truthfully, I had never heard of Nitrous 9, so it, it was a, a good introduction to it. Um, this is a good use for your Chromebook. We'll get that running I'm, for I'm you. Just <laughs> burning, I was just baiting you. I was hoping you were going to say it sucked, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Curtis and Ken are here on the call, so yeah. Uh, no, that was good. Quick, quick question. Do you guys ever get Steve Bjork at the Coco Fest? <laughs> Bjork. We have. Yeah. Yeah, he was a couple of years ago. He was at one. Yeah, because twenty eighteen. Uh, he, he made some good games for the Coco, uh, like Stellar Lifeline and uh, uh, a few others. I can't remember the names. Uh, Megabug, Megabug, Popcorn, Puyan. Canyon Climber, Puyan. Well, he held with Puyan. Zaxxon, yeah. Rampage, yeah, Pitfall, uh, Pitfall Two, Super Pitfall, Super Pitfall. Yeah. Yeah, he made some good stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's actually might... in our Discord on occasion too. So you can, you do join there, you might be able to actually talk to him in person. He might right, be watching cool. the stream today. Might be. Rick yeah. Adams as well. Yeah, Rick yep. Adams was there at the show. Off of Shanghai uh, and Temple of Rome. And... Nick Morentes, who's on the call right now, he did the game developer presentation, him and a few other people too that were there. Yeah, Ghana Buana was another one that they're mentioning. A lot, a lot of games. Desert Rider. Game. Yeah, Desert yeah. Rider. Sands of Egypt. Sands of Egypt. <laughs> and the list goes on. Yeah. Um, Cool. So that's cool that you're doing gaming now and you're doing gaming. You're making modern computer games based on your kind of vintage hobby of, of kind of war gaming, which is kind of cool. Uh, everybody's got a hobby somewhere, right? So yeah. um, that's cool. I, I don't know if there's anything else you want to tell us or if anybody in the live chat or the panel has questions for you, David. I got um, a question for you. Go ahead, David. Mr. Dill. All right. Hey, um, what does Motorola do now, basically? Oh, uh, public safety stuff uh the division i work in works uh, makes uh, 911 networks and sells them to the local uh police departments and uh fire departments and stuff are they building chips or no uh motorola end up breaking into two pieces uh motorola solutions and motorola i'm ac actually at motorola solutions so we just do public safety whereas the motorola that broke off that was bought by the chinese uh they they took the chip stuff, but I don't know if they still make chips uh, or not anymore. They do the phone. I thought, I thought that split into Freescale and then went to NXP, Philips. Hmm. Freescale and then NXP is what. Is what. But, yeah, so I, I think you're probably aware that the, co the color computer's processor was made by Motorola, right? The 6809 right. is Motorola. And, yep. and, and that Motorola made the 68000 series that a lot of things ran on, like the Amigas and... Um, and they were making the power PC processors at eight thousand risk chips. Okay, kind of stuff yeah. In. So Motorola did a lot of CPU stuff for a long mm -hmm. time, uh, especially the Coco, which is yeah. So that's kind of cool that you started off on a computer based on a Motorola processor, and now you're working for Motorola, right? So yep, <laughs> the circle is now complete. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> hey, hey, David, I was wondering, do you work with the Moto Turbo stuff? Ah. Uh, I used to work with a project called VTrack, and uh, some of the software it would deploy was from Mo Moto Turbo. I'm not actually sure what Moto Turbo is, uh, but I've heard of it. We use and what, a, what operating system do you guys run <clears throat> on your on your Motorola stuff for? Safety, uh, I'm not sure what they're using on their, as far as an operating system, to be honest. Uh, what I do there is I create software that's used to design a uh, new network. So like, let's say a customer says we need a new network for this uh, police department or fire department or whatever. Uh, the, the software helps the engineers place the the different uh, servers into the racks and stuff. And then it figures out the cable lengths and stuff. So they just place the servers in the racks, get them set up however they want. They press a button, Dijkstra's algorithm runs, or actually a modified version of it. And it gets the cable lengths for everything. Interesting. So kind of network planning. Yep. Very cool. 
James oh. Diffendeffer says NXP still makes chips too. So. Yeah, I remember when I used to have a Motorola Droid phone, and when they were when, Mo when Motorola was still making hardware phones, and then I think at some point in time that name had gotten purchased, and later Motorola phones I'd bought were actually made by Lenovo, and I know Lenovo, which used to be an IBM thing, was bought out by I think somewhere in China too. So, yeah, these things. Lenovo kind of is a Chinese company, and they bought IBM's PC division, so they make all the desktops and laptops. Gotcha. Actually, they made them before. Before IBM even sold them the line, they basically contracted them out, so they didn't make them here. Okay. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, so, uh, what what have you seen? Uh, have you seen our show before, Coco Talk? Uh, I, I think I saw an episode or two. Yeah, in, in the past. Yeah, we. I think we're on our fourth episode now. So, if you've seen an episode or two, you've seen most of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, our, I think our fourth good episode. Yeah, two hundred episodes don't count. When I've watched your I, I've watched your other YouTube channel quite a bit. Your uh, uh, OG St Stevie Stro channel I watch quite a bit. Oh yeah, that's legendary. There's uh, there's tens of twenties of people that have seen that thing. So <laughs> yeah, but legendary in, in his own mind. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, um, let's make sure we we plug um, Dave's channel for the um, computer hobbyists. And put that put that one out there in the uh, in the live chat for us. Uh, that is in the description. Let me see if I can stick that out there for you right now. So yeah, I think we just I just I posted it earlier. And posted okay, it again. we'll we'll post it again. So we'll go ahead and make sure everybody's got your YouTube channel. They can check that out. So on that YouTube channel, you've got a tour of VCF Midwest that you did this year. You've got a tour of Cocoa Fest that I looked at this morning that looked pretty cool. Uh, and then you did an, you and I did an interview together where you were asking me about my first color computer and what got me into computers and stuff. So I'm glad I could return the favor and get you on here with us for an interview. Yeah, I appreciate and, it. Thank you. And um, hopefully more people will subscribe to your channel and watch your videos and all that kind of good stuff. We've got to support each other here in the Coco community and the retro sphere. Um, if, the, if nobody has any questions or maybe the questions will come up during the show, you're welcome to hang out. We're going to be here for hours on end, David, but you're right. welcome to hang I, out as long I as you like. I can hang out about another 25 minutes. So okay. I'll stay until one. All right. Hey, David, how often do you come out with new videos on your, on your channel? Just up here. So do you have a schedule or do you just kind of do them as they come? On the board game channel, Centurion's Review, I, I'd come out with like three or four videos a week. As far as computer hobbyists, about one every two or three weeks. Uh, the computer hobbyist videos are more, uh, involved than the videos for the board game channel i mean the board game channel videos are easy to make like if you're doing like a playthrough you just set up the game and start set up the camera and start playing so i mean if the game takes a half hour to play it'll take another half hour or an hour to edit and then you can just post it so most of the videos for the centurion's review take like less than two hours to create including editing so those i can do like four a week whereas uh computer hobbyists uh, th those take significantly more time. Like uh, some of the ones where I show people how to write code, uh, I got to write the code on my own and stuff. So one of the videos I did about creating a text box from scratch, I had to spend a few, uh, maybe four hours uh, uh, writing the code for it. And then uh, created the video where I showed people how it worked and stuff. And I did one that was a review of this uh, laptop I'm using right now. And that one took about, uh, maybe 10 hours to create. Wow. Yeah, even our show takes, you know, multiple hours just to record it, and, and we kind mm -hmm. of just gave up on editing. <laughs> <laughs> Do it live, right? We'll make, we'll, we'll make it up in volume. If we make a mistake today, <laughs> we'll make less mistakes on a future episode. Yeah, we're going to get louder and louder <laughs> as time goes on. That's our plan. Cool. All right. Well, feel free to hang out. Definitely. Thanks for joining us today. And oh, you're uh, welcome. And Thank if, you for having me. Oh, oh, my pleasure. And if you have like, uh, if you have another video that's that you're going to be releasing in the future, especially if it's retro related, if you want to come on our show and kind of do a teaser or a world premiere or a plug and you know, uh, let us let, get the word out for you. Feel free to, to come on whenever you got more things to promote. Love to have you back on. Um, all right. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. All right. So what we'll do now is we're going to go ahead. We will take a break. We will thank our patrons for sponsoring our show. We'll see who's new to Discord. We'll take a commercial break, and then we'll come back with the Game On results. I believe we've got a new uh, Coco Thoughts from Samuel Gimes as well. Uh, so we'll see what all's going on here. Um, 
as I press a few buttons here. So let's start off by thanking our patrons, and then we'll see who's new to Discord. And Jason the Coco Man is here. That's one of the celebrities you saw at VCF Midwest was Coco Man. <laughs> so, um, and and the lovely I'm uh, just here for the free snacks. Yeah, the lovely Sarah was there too. Is Sarah in the car with you? I am. Hello, hey, Sarah. everyone. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Thank you, Patrons. Give the man a bag of peanuts. At Coco Talk, we'd like to thank the patrons who sponsor the program. So our heartfelt gratitude goes out to Alan Huffman, Alan Murphy, Blair Ledoux, Bowden Aaron, Brendan Donahue, Brian Weasler, Karen Anscombe, D. Bruce Moore, Daniel Williams, Diego, Eric Canales, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Vebke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Jason Downs, Ken Reichert, Kyle Etter, Malfunct, Michael Pitsley, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Paul Thayer, Rick Eulin, Rob Inman, Rocky Hill, Stephen Wagner, Steve Batson, Steve Rasmussen, Terry Steen, Terry Steggy, The Backyard Shed Gang, Tom C., Tom Gunderson, Tom Heron, Tom S., Tony C., and William Athing. Thank you ever so much, patrons. Benja Jonah. I'm Benjamin and I'm into the Coco 2 and 3. Idle PX. Hi. My name is Jamie. I haven't touched a Coco since I was a teenager, but, I have a Coco 1 and Coco 2 that I picked up to play with. Just looking to learn more and see what is available and fun these days, both hardware and software-wise. Drekisk. Hi. My name is David. I bought my first Coco 2 to replace my OSI Challenger 1P back in the early 1980s. This very handsome man by the name of Steve did a YouTube video mentioning this server in Discord, something I've never used before. So, here I am. The previous bios were edited for time's sake. Thanks to, Melly, Boysontech, Paul Fiscarelli, Terry Stagy, and the Coca Talk patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer at discord.cocotalk.live. Hi, it's Chris Boyle, part of the uh, Coco Talk crew of people. Hey everybody, this is Bill Noble, co-author of Nitrous 9. You are listening to Coco Talk Live, the leading live Coco Talk show. Good day, mates. This is Nick Marionettes, author of such color computer titles as Donut Disaster, Rupert Rhymes, and Rockstar Pilot. And I am here today to tell you about the world's most fabulous operating system, OS9. OS9 and its current incarnation, Nitrous 9, is the most advanced operating system ever created. And what makes it so good? Ease of use. I find OS9 so incredibly intuitive that I haven't once cracked open the user manual. And yet I've been able to create such incredible games faster than the time it takes to sing Waltzing Matilda. Using OS 9, I expect my next game, Funstar, will be done this weekend and distributed exclusively on ROM cartridge. OS 9 forever. Any resemblance to actual events to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Hi, this is Max Jackson, live from Coco Fest. And you listen to The Real Game, Steve Shrow. A whole new approach. Faster than ever. A window to a world of possibilities. Clear your expectations. Clear your hesitation. Just hit clear.
Download EOU today at lcurtisboyle.com. Hi, this is Sean Wheatley, and you're listening to Copa Talk, the original gamer, Stevie Strip. All right, and we're back. And this is the part of the show where um, typically Nick Morota was really, really uh, a big fan of this segment here because uh, his name was mentioned many, many times. He got to talk, hear himself, be worshipped, and all those good things. And so while Nick Morota is not with us in person, he's always with us in spirit, and we do look forward to having him back on the show in the future. But in the meantime, we carry that torch of the Game On Challenge. Um, the Game On Challenge with Nick Morota featuring Nick Morota's stunt do- double, Ken Waters, Canadian Retro Things. We still have him being, the role still being filled by a Canadian. So we're fulfilling our contractual obligations in that regard there. Um, and we kick these things off usually with a... Um, a deep thought, a cocoa thought from the deep thinker Samuel Gimes. Now, sometimes Samuel Gimes' thoughts are related to the game. Sometimes they're song parodies. I'm not sure what we're going to get today. This one's like a box of chocolates. You just don't know what you're going to get. But we're all going to experience this together, the world debut of uh, a new cocoa thoughts from Samuel Gimes. So fasten your seatbelt, boys and girls. And now, cocoa thoughts by Samuel Gimes. I am the gate crasher. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Shoot all the computers. Beautiful. Bang, it's bang, seasonal bang, bang, and relevant. Bang, bang. <laughs> Don't shoot the programmers. Bang, 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 bang. Kill all the black suit guys. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> I'm out of ammo. Click, 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 click. <laughs> Mission failed. <laughs> Mission failed. <laughs> oh my god. That was classic. Was... Hey guys, what was that Wolfenstein clone called uh, that they just showed? That looked cool. That's a game by our Nicholas Morantes on the call right now. The game's called Gate Crasher. Oh, cool. That was our game this week for the Game On Challenge. Yeah, you'll be seeing a lot more of it right away here. <laughs> oh, my God. Samuel Glimes, we salute you, sir. For those about to rock, click, 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 we click. Yeah. salute you. Oh, <laughs> man. It was about the game. It's tied into the holiday season. That is a new instant classic. Woo. That's, a, that's an earworm if I ever heard one. Oh, yeah. Bang, bang, <laughs> bang, bang, bang. I'll get strange looks from my family, but I'm playing that at Christmas. Yeah, right. And we've just been joined by Brian, the music man. And, I, and on your video, David, when you showed Coco Fest, you had pointed out that Brian was playing the music at Coco Fest from right. the MIDI controller. This is the guy who did it here in the bottom yeah, corner yeah, of the screen. Yeah, yeah. Hello, oh, everybody. Cool. Hey, Brian, the music man. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and kick it off. Let's get into the high score results and the game on challenge uh, and all that good stuff. So let's see who played and let's see what the scores were this week. High score challenge. Welcome, everybody, to the results of this week's Coco Talk Game On Challenge of the Week, where we played Gatecrasher. There were a total of 12 players, so let's see how everybody did. Had David Craker with 170. Bang, Canadian bang, Retro bang, Things bang, with bang. 370. Coco Man, 680. Jim Rye, 760. Sloopy Malibu, 810. Data Soup, 860. Nick Marentes, 1510. I'm the author. Mr. Dave, 6309, 1570. L. Curtis Boyle, 1960. HSI, 2450. Wow. Buck Owens, 3340. Buck Owens is not in first place. And the number one score this week belongs to. Flutterball with 3360. Congratulations to everybody that played this week, and we will see you next week. 
All right, congratulations, Flutterball. I think that's a new first time high scorer winner, possibly. And yeah, I, think, I think it is. I think that's the highest score you can get in that game, isn't it, Nick? Pretty well. Yeah, the scoring's pretty fixed in uh, Gate Crusher. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, and he made it right to the end. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And Buck was saying that he missed one guy, so that's why he was 20 yeah. points behind. Wow. So. All right. Well, let's take a look at Buck Owens um, did post a video here. Uh, let's see. Is this, yeah, this is Buck's of the end of the game uh -oh. and who you get to kill. Is it JR? Carrie's <laughs> uh, about to go in. Oh, going through a door. Uh-oh. Mm -mm, the final mm -mm, door. Mm -mm. I think he's uh -uh, going to go uh -uh. in. He's waiting. He's waiting. Uh -uh. There we go. Oh, well, who is that? Who is that? Is that Ted Koppel? <laughs> <laughs> David Led. It's David it's Led Mr. with <laughs> hair. <laughs> it's <Ooh>. the gate. <laughs> so the and object of the, the game, game is the... to actually kill Bill Gates? <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, the title of the game makes sense. Terminator. Terminated. Mission accomplished. Terminated. Now, remember, this was... This was back in 1999. Uh, everyone hated Bill Gates and yeah, Microsoft right. back then. <laughs> Some of us still do. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's he, right. Yeah. He won't be back. <laughs> I'll, I'll have you know, Nick, that last night I was watching this over and over because uh, Windows updated on my computer and nothing would work after that. And I was cursing a lot. So I just, for feeling better, I was watching this video. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Buck. Making All right, and Mr. here Gates. is some footage from Flutterball. Flutterball. In this bang, video, bang, he bang, makes bang, it all bang. the way to the end, but he runs out of the... This is his second playthrough. Made it all the way to the end, but he ran out of ammo, ammo trying to kill Bill Gates. And uh, yeah, didn't didn't win it in this one. Click, 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 click. Click, yeah. Click, click, click. <laughs> yeah, and we should mention that uh, Nick actually patched the game to make it a bit easier for everybody because the yes. original settings are almost impossible. And if you ran out of bullets, you would die. Well, you still, you run out of bullets, you die. But we took the timer off because uh, most people yeah, that you could die it, from health, you could die from running out of time, you could die from running out of bullets. Even if there was more bullets left in the level, you just hadn't found them yet, but you just instantly died because you ran out of bullets, mm -hmm. which made yeah. no sense. There were a few things I uh, wasn't happy about the game, and and uh, so I pr provided two pokes before the uh, live show just to uh, correct those two annoyances. Now Otherwise, you, no one no one would have gotten you to the had, end. You, I think you had mentioned in the past that you might um, revisit this, like how you've like fixed Donut Dilemma a few times. And yeah, stuff like that. yeah. You... So that that may become a uh, a future um update to a version two maybe yeah or maybe add joystick control or something else and definitely joystick control i actually played it with joystick uh by using a patch on the pc to make the joystick emulate the keyboard oh otherwise i couldn't play it either <laughs> <laughs> which i think pretty well sums it up yeah, <laughs> but but the funny thing is when David Lent saw this and he hadn't seen it before, the first words out of his mouth was, "Where did that Wolfenstein game come from?" So right away, it was very obvious what this game is like, and the fact that it's being done on a color computer, an eight-bit system that does not have the speed and power of a PC that Wolfenstein ran on uh, is is very impressive, you know. Yeah, and even as digitized sound effects like the picking up of ammo rounds and health and uh, stuff is pretty yeah. similar to those games. Yeah, the the sound is good. There's no sound in this video playing at the moment, but um, you have the option of doing that, Ken, just so people can hear what it sounds like. Uh, yeah, there was no sound in this video. No, this sound. Oh, this, this one, one didn't. didn't huh? And uh, uh, I've got video. I've got a short video I can quickly play to, that okay. shows some of the sound. Sure. Uh, but as as Eric quick. pointed out, the curves in the walls really bring something to this display. It's so much nicer than it, just a straight boxes. Right. The, uh, yeah, it's kind of like you're that. wearing uh, goggles or something. The fish some eye. Sort of it's a fish goggles. eye, yeah. It's a, a well, side effect it just, of the 3D engine. Which and it gives, is something it, I don't like, actually. I, I like it. It gives you resolution that isn't really there. 
by having the curves. You, okay. You <laughs> but most importantly, there's lots of little mastermind games yeah. to open the doors. Ah, uh, yeah. With a bug, apparently. Uh, yeah. The... There was one bug there, too, yeah. Did that get fixed or that's a feature? No, no, you can you can work around it. <laughs> it's a fe- yeah, it's a feature. It's a feature. That's right. If well, don't find... forget, this is the Microsoft Corporation, so <laughs> their, their security <laughs> system is meant to have bugs. Yeah, did so you I get figured... any guys hit that special blue screen of death that comes up in the middle of the game? No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Damn, bad guys shooting at you. So it's very realistic. <laughs> that yeah. would be funny if you did a, like a, 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 a fake B, BSOD on there. That's that's one of your kill screens when you die. Yeah, <laughs> right. Do you have your video there with the sound there, Nick? Or uh, yeah. Do you have to stop okay, sharing? I will stop sharing. And actually, um, if you wing the computers you're shooting at, it should blue screen, and they have to shoot it again, and then it dies. Right. Yeah, that's a good idea. I will share my screen. Go for it. Make sure you share sound. I'm gonna share sound. Share. Okay, is that coming up? Let me see uh, uh, a black, black screen with a player. VLC. Okay, yes. I'm going to hit play. Hit play. Woohoo. Yes. Oh, you shot the programmer. Do you lose points for shooting programmers? Arcade sound. CEO battle. Click, 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 click. Click, click. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Does Bill shoot back at you? <laughs> Uh, yes, he does, I think. He likes makes yep. Santa Claus sound. It's ho, 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 ho. Obviously inspired by Gaim's song. Sounds more like the Noid from the old uh, commercials. Pizza Noid. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so your health is at one bar on the left. Huh? H is your health? Yep. And yeah, his ammo's yeah, will really low too. So. Yeah, one shot left. Yeah. This is the unpatched version. Uh oh, you're out of bullets? I'm dead. So does this game require 128k of RAM then or five twelve? Uh five twelve. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So oh, if you well. don't have a five twelve uh Coco three, you, you just can, gotta use one of the emulators. You can emulate it. So what mm-hmm. does it say terminated mission accomplished? Did you accomplish it or not? Uh, yes, because there's a picture of Bill Gates and it says terminated, so mission you, accomplished. So you did kill Bill Gates? Yeah, you terminated him. But but the, but it said... Well, in your video, because you, you died with mission failed, so... I think he was just showing the different screens. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, so, yeah. You so, cheated, in other words, gotcha. I cheated, okay. in other words, yeah. <laughs> you were watching the demo, Stevie. Okay. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the actual gameplay, it was a demo. Okay. There you go. No, but the sound effects are really good. Yeah. yeah, he's got the the thumping when you walk. He's got the clicking when you pick up the ammo clips. And yeah. like we need some effects. like some Duke Nukem sound bites in there too. Come get some. Ooh, that's gotta <laughs> hurt. <laughs> Bright. Okay, should be enough for anyone. Rear end. <laughs> See, or, Nick, you're getting all these good or, ideas. Or, now or for at, at least two. at least a David Ladd one. A rally, a rally, <laughs> a rally. Okay. Cool. Well, that'll be version two. <laughs> and what characters will you have in that one? David Ladd. <laughs> the successor to Bill Gates. <laughs> uh, oh, it's uh, called Weasel Crasher. Really? Weasel Crasher. <laughs> Weasel Crasher. <laughs> <laughs> so what else you got for us, Mr. Waters of Canadian Retro Things? Um, well, so... Um, Do we have tips yeah, and tricks it, from the audience? I did not get a lot of time to play this game. I did play it a bit, and I had a lot of fun. But, um, yeah, what were the tips and tricks other people discovered? Because if I remember moves. the shift key for uh, moving yeah. faster left and right, because a lot of people that have played it and didn't read the directions did not know that, so you're doing the slow crawl, turning left and right. Slow turning to keep getting shot by the... There's a map suits. available. Um, who, yeah. who is the winner? Uh who was the winner of the game comp? Um, Flutterball. 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 Flutterball made some maps. Um, they're available on the Discord. Some really well done maps. So I highly recommend grabbing those maps to play it. Just makes it easier so you're not running around like wondering where to go. You know exactly where the where the um, um, ba- the suits are and programmers and uh, ammo loads and health. 
Yeah, and the computers you have to shoot to get out the off level. And the computers, yeah. Nick, I just want to say thanks for making this. When I found, actually stumbled upon it a couple weeks ago, man, I was blown away. I can't <laughs> believe it could be done on a Coco. It was, it was and, pretty huge when you released this back in, was it 99 or 2000? I'm trying to remember. 99, well, yeah, 99 is when I, I finished it. And, and I, I don't think I mentioned it last week, but Terry was the one that uh, suggested we play it, so. Yeah. Is Terry getting a portion of the proceeds from the uh, sales on this as well? Or? Uh, well, it's free <laughs> now, <laughs> so. He gets a free Ferrari. <laughs> free Ferrari. <laughs> All of us gullible yeah. people back in 2000 that bought it, we're the ones that you know paid for that. So. <laughs> the Hot Wheels, I got a hurdle. That's it. <laughs> and in the Discord, uh, um, Nick did post the uh, file for if you wanted to print out your own uh, custom sleeve for the disc if you put it on discs. Oh, so. neat. Yeah, which is what Nick did back in the day. He'd have the directions and stuff printed on the disc sleeve itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was cheaper than boxes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Cool stuff. Any other tips and tricks or just fond memories of playing the game this week? Um, uh, has a famous Arnold Schwarzenegger line, if it moves, kill it. <laughs> if it moves, kill it. Huh? <laughs> Unless it's a programmer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I well, found a few, few tips I had is if you're – if you're having a suit run away from you down a long hallway, if you actually follow him, you can kind of keep him center tracked until he hits a corner. And if you got it aimed properly, you can kill him pretty, pretty quickly. Um, trying to do them when they're swinging around corners and looping around in, in a, an open, but short hallway, they go like left and then behind you and then right and come up the right side, et cetera. So it's much harder to hit. So I usually back myself as far as I can go. So I have a long forward area to try to mm-hmm. hit him with um, the mastermind game. I usually just do like RRR and then you'll you'll see either one red bar or, or dot or, or none or whatever. And then you can kind of figure out how many of other colors you have to guess. And that seems to help a fair bit. Um, and of course, they reset if you, you get it wrong after was it six tries or something. Six, yeah. So I, um, I, I tend to uh, make sure that I've, I'm well loaded up with health and ammo before I enter a new level and then enter the level fully charged. And just go for the go for the suits. Just blast them as quick as you can, because the quicker you get rid of them, then you don't keep getting annoyed and shot at later on when you're trying to find ammo and uh, more um, health. Yeah. So One I, other I thing, I guess, to mention too, on, on health and ammo, both. If you're already maxed out or just about maxed out, if you pick some up, it doesn't keep extra in reserve. Like no, it just maxes no. out, so you'll basically be wasting a clip or wasting. So some health. save some, yeah. So if you're in good health and you find one, don't pick it up. Leave it for when you And need remember it. where it is so that you can go back to get it later. Yeah, I never remembered where stuff was in that game. Well, that's right. You run around door to door. Look, Even looking at the map, it. I still didn't have a clue where I was most of the time. So There's a few areas where the computer is hidden behind a, a, a little doorway that sometimes if you don't go there and actually look in the little corridor way, you don't see the computer. So, you know, you enter the room, you can't see any computer, but you, you know, unless you go into the corner of the room to look, you know, down the uh, corridor. Yeah, it'll be know, a tiny look. little L shape in that little yeah, tip of the L right. where you little can't L see unless you walk You've there. got to go in there and have a look. Um, many times I've been, had one computer left and I, I can't find it anywhere. And it's just that one room where there's a little L shaped corridor and a computer is tucked away there. It's obviously the, the secret room where the programmers go to watch porn through yeah. the day. And that's why it's, <laughs> that's why, why it's so hidden. <laughs> hey, so, so, Nick, knowing what you know now and all the things you've learned and optimizations and better programming techniques and stuff, um, do you think now, you know, 20 years later, you could make that engine and tune it more? For sure. Yep. Yeah, no, definitely can. Not only tune the engine, but also there's a lot of things I don't. I, I don't like the way the scoring works. Um, like Ken said before, basically the, the the score is fixed. When you play the entire game, you there's only certain number of of suits um, and computers that you can collect. If you collect them all, you'll get the same score every time. I would have preferred a more a, a scoring system where you can actually get more score the harder you um, try. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah like maybe get bonuses for unlocking doors bonuses. first try like or something. Bonuses, you complete yeah. a level, for example, whatever time you a do time the level bonus, in. Or maybe yeah, like, things um, like that. Uh, if Leftover ammo at the end of the game and health. Yeah, some sort of a reward. I don't think there is system. such a thing, is there? <laughs> and then um, maybe bonus for like consecutive kills, like kill streaks if you got two or three kills in a row without missing. Well, yeah, like the woohoo moment should be bonus. At the points. moment, you get the woohoo, but yeah, I should have okay. put a score there, for example. Cool. But the one I mean, thing I didn't know before until you you told me about it, Nick, during the gameplay t- uh, this week, is that uh, the woohoo doesn't matter what you kill. You can kill like one of the programmers too, and that counts. Yeah, it, it, I think it's two or three rapid kills of anything. Um, it, it's basically a um, it's a recording of uh, Homer Simpson, uh, and he, he just goes woohoo because he gets, he gets a bit of an adrenaline right. adrenaline rush. That's his Duke Nukem moment, I guess. Right, yeah, right. yeah. So he doesn't care what he kills as long uh, as he kills. Jeremy Landry says it'd be nice to get a bonus for surviving programmers. So for for how many hostages you can free, you get a bonus for that or something too. That's yeah, right. not yeah. accidentally kill. So there's so many things yeah. with the yeah. scoring. I can but, improve. But, but the what what came to mind when you mentioned if you go into a room and you can't see something, do you think you could get enough? Um, cycles to where you could maybe do like an outline of the walls where it wouldn't be like just blue in front of blue and it's just one big blue blob but you could kind of see the wireframe of oh uh, yeah but i want i wanted uh the solid walls okay I mean, wireframes yeah. for cheating okay. um so, gotcha i mean in a real environment you you can't really you haven't got x-ray vision right so. true true you need to put some x-ray glasses you can find in it and they'll work for a little while so you can see through oh, the walls perk. there yeah. you go <laughs> I, I sense a lot of feature creep on a 20 plus year old game happening here oh yeah there, there's so many things yeah. well you could just you could stick just... control for starters yeah, just... so for future feature creeps on this just uh you can dm nick in discord <laughs> like can i get an update for my original 1999 floppy copy oh, yeah you'll get comp- five cents off um <laughs> With the with the with the uh, with the original printed instructions right That's on the a collector, uh, collector's item. That's worth more now. Yeah, I've got one of those too. I'm hoarding it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you're you're so killing it's, me, it, Jason. It's it's wor- oh, it doesn't say TDP 100 on it. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh yeah, despite what Erico says, um, I do want to fix that fish eye because I I think it's ugly. The fish eye look, the curvature that you see on the walls. Okay. I, I, I do know of a way to get rid of that. Okay. Well, it is, a get rid of that. it is a distinctive look that is unique to that game. So well, you, I guess so. Yeah. Because so yeah, many yeah. things look like wireframes. And, you know. Yeah, this one has a, rigid. Kind of a, a smoothness yeah. to it. A little bit. I thought that was just, uh, I thought the fish eye thing was just a limitation of the, uh, the 3D al- algorithm in the Coco, at least at the time. It, is. it was. It oh, was. Okay. It is. Well, but, oh, well, if you want to call it a feature, yeah, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a look. Right? Jeremy, a look. Jeremy look. Landry says that game needs more donuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. We, that, shouldn't the programmers be carrying donuts? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you got Homer. Woohoo. Don't, Woo. mm, donuts. Right, right. <laughs> Curvy walls. Or... Yeah, the health, the health bits should be donuts. Piles of donuts mm-hmm. on the floor. Just he grabs mm-hmm. and eats them. <laughs> Nick, I'm going to tell you, when I played it first, I thought the curvy walls, If after seeing who was at the end, if you were to back up, it was a labyrinth, and the curves were part of Microsoft, the word Microsoft. The whole- <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent plot twist, isn't it? Yeah, you it is. right. and again, Erico saying he likes it. So, you have one vote Just- for Fisheye. And if David Lyon is a bad guy, too. it can just be a big yeah. disc that you're in. All right. Ooh, yeah. Remember, click, 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 click. Well, I remember like Nick back in the day after it was released, because uh, I think I brought up the fish, I think, too, at the time. And you said that you, at the time you didn't know how to fix it. That, that was the only reason it's there. Yeah. Yeah. There are ways to fix it. But I, anyway. I do have one suggestion for version two. If Mr. Ladd is our uh, evil uh, boss at the end. Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper grenades. I think that'd be awesome. Oh, there you go. <laughs> diet, Dr. diet, Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper yeah. <laughs> yes, I've got my diet, Dr. Pepper. And instead of blowing up computers, you there'll be grease weasels. <laughs> Save the world. Get my grease weasel. 
and mix them. Oh yes, you have that. That that should that could be like a mini bonus game where you have to mix the water and diet Dr Pepper to the, the appropriate right ratio. ratios. Yes, yes. There you go. You get pl plenty of ideas here. No shortage. Plenty of, of feature creep on a twenty-plus-year-old game. Get yes. on it. Yes, right. that's, that's your next so. side project, right? <laughs> yeah, Nick, you don't have to design games anymore. We'll do that for you. You just have to write them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, do we have more to say about this? Are we yeah. ready to go? Yes, Alan Murphy has something to say. So everybody, shh, shh, pay attention. Sloopy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't worry. We're going to call on Sloopy. I won't let Steve move us on before. Okay, well, I, I will just say one away. thing. It was a groundbreaking game for the Coco, kind of like Donkey Thanks, Kong man. by Sockmaster was. We'd never seen a full 3D engine like that before. We'd seen some wireframe stuff. We'd seen some fixed perspective like Venom Slayer, Dungeons of Daggerath. But this was the first, quote unquote, true 3D engine. And and it was based on uh, Sockmaster's uh, Gloom engine. Yeah. So I mean, I, I I didn't know all the math. Well, I didn't <clears> understand all the 3D. So I mean, Sockmaster had to explain it to me, and he told me how the algorithm worked, and basically I coded coded the game from that. So he he takes credit for the engine. That's cool. It was okay. a great game. It was a lot of fun. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a tough one. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll get the hairs on the chest growing. <laughs> I'm sure it's broken a few keyboards. <laughs> Groundbreaking, like right. Pump Man, Jason says, or um, Ken says. Pump Man. Pump Man. Pump Man. Yeah, pump man. All right. Uh, so, so I we... see uh, Sloopy is back. So I guess we could uh, talk about the live playthrough. It looked pretty successful. Sloopy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Here. Oh. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see here. Share screen. And this screen and share. This week we had seven players at one time. And I uh, want to make a special uh, shout out to uh, Mikey Furman, who joined us um, to play because uh, that was a glaring example uh, a mission that I didn't say that he played. Uh, we also had uh, uh, the Coco Man with us. I even believe... made it to level two. Yeah. And let me see here. It was, no, that's not him. He did something that no one has done on this game before or on our show before. He was playing on real hardware. Now I know I had uh, focused on it. Where is it? Uh, nope. And I heard the language got pretty late night on this episode. <laughs> that was me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag blame Curtis. Yeah. yeah. We'll fix it in post. This is a game you get pretty yeah. heated with. Oh, yeah. That, that's. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't mind people saying pancakes on the show, but just whatever you do, don't say waffles. What about blueberry pancakes? I went full waffle, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, you went full walk. waffle. But yeah, we had seven people playing. This is uh, uh, must Coco be Man in the top left. Okay. Playing That's real hardware? Real hardware. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, because I, I uh, focused I, on I, it during I, the show. I'm surprised I was, you know, the only person using real hardware. That's just surprising. But I guess I am a hardware guy, so I gotta, I gotta maintain that. I gotta, I gotta use the real to, hardware. Being able to play it and see it and capture it and feeding into Discord takes a lot of stuff. extra hardware and stuff too. Yeah. It's, it's capture cards and stuff. So. I mean, what I was doing was I'm just using a cheapy HDMI capture that I bought on like Amazon or eBay or something, and just running it through OBS. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I and do then, too. Uh, and then I'm nope. taking, you know, I'm using a, you know, a sh shameless plug. I'm using a Wallaby cable to split off my uh, <laughs> RGB, and um, and then I'm, you know, I'm I'm looking at the CM my CM8, but mm -hmm. I'm capturing off a switcheroo and then you know running it through HDMI. Yeah, because I, I know some people have complained if they tried to run it through like a recording hardware, et cetera, or you know, streaming hardware, that there was a delay. So you'd hit a key and mm -hmm. it doesn't take effect at the same time on the screen. So having the splitter where you're actually seeing the live CM8 stream at Coco speed, even if there is a delay on the capture device, that would be much, much easier. Yep, that, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I tried to do uh, stream real, real systems. I have a cheapy uh, 
USB uh, thing. <clears throat> Unfortunately, yeah. on certain screens, it just does not like the signal from the Coco. On other screens, it's fine. Um, I tried running it on Seamus, and like on room zero, it looked beautiful. But as soon as I went to room, yeah, room one or two, yeah, it started like spazzing. The screen was like yeah. just like out of sync and kind of shifting up. You know, it was really weird. Right, and it just was not playable. And the thing is, is it was really weird because it was worse on my real screen than it was in uh, in the uh, stream. <laughs> it looks so. like your video is frozen, Sloopy. Oh, he's got uh, paused. I'm, I've got the it he's paused. Got a pause thing. Oh, oh, oh then it's it's, yeah. it's frozen by de design. Then yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, I was waiting to talk again. This this is actually uh, this is Jason's playing on the real machine. Jason's computer, man. Yeah. Playing poorly, but yes, on real hardware nonetheless. So, Jason, in your case, you don't have those weird glitches with your capture stuff, do you? Oh, you can see a little bit of noise on it there, but um, no, I didn't have. I, I was able to play Seamus uh, last week, and I was using an RGB patch version, but uh, no. So, I, 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 like, I think I mentioned that. this before in, in the last year or two, but we really need to get a list of capture devices that really work properly with a Coco, and so we can help steer people towards getting you know ones that don't yeah. have these weird problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, this is just some cheapy no name. This is HD capture on but it. See, this is, like he's stick. doing the RGB to HDMI, which is a better way than trying to do composite, right? So, yeah. composite capture I've, is hit or miss because the composite signal is way out of spec. Yeah, I've personally my... found that um, when, I, when I'm capturing stuff out straight off the Coco, the really cheap capture cards work the best. The more expensive ones spaz out on me. So everything that I'm capturing off Coco is always on a cheap capture card, and it never fails. Well, I'm glad I went cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did. I did one. put a fan on this thing because it does get a little warm. I had a I had a fan blowing on it. Like I have I, a I have like a hundred and fifty dollar capture card which won't work with the Coco, and I've got a twelve dollar one which works fine with it. One thing I do notice yeah. on yours is a little. There's a little ghosting on the um, moving around and stuff. You can kind of see some of that, and that's just, I guess, the refreshing of the frames or something that the capture is introducing. Um, but it looks good though. Yeah, it could be. I'd have to I'd try like a local recording at some point and see how that looks. But and, and Sloopy, you're about to say something too. What were you going to say? Um, <laughs> yeah, I have a real cheap one, and uh, when it works, the picture is is beautiful. And when it doesn't, it is horrendous. <laughs> so, but um, it's the luck of the draw. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm going to have to dig through uh, my uh, cavern of stuff and try to find my PVR 150 because that thing would digitize, uh, bring in uh, composite video and look gorgeous no matter what. And I've used it on several different classic systems. But, um, yeah, as we can see, uh, uh, had seven people playing. It was quite popular. And uh, we had uh, the uh, Lord Nicholas himself playing. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> hey, I asked you what your name was. You said Lord Nicholas. Uh, now, how are you not in first place, Nick? You you programmed it. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> programmers are all, not always the best players yeah now there are the best yes. cheaters but yeah. yeah i can cheat well but yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I haven't played it in years yeah I, I had seen that i had seen bill gates there at the end uh, at penfest you had some kind of you had some kind of cheat code or something at least in the demo copy that you had there and showed us but actually it's yeah. still in there Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, it was uh quite popular and uh seemed to be well liked by most people yeah like literally over half of this week's participants were on the live stream which is yeah good. and that's just a reminder that uh if you do play on the live stream snap a picture and uh put it up on discord to be in the uh um scoring chart Yes, and if you forget to uh, snap a picture of your screen, you can go back to the uh, replay and 
snap a picture of it from there. Yep. yep. I'm not going to name any names. No, we Sloopy, won't talk about Sloopy. Yes, yeah, Sloopy knows who he is. <laughs> has, has anyone played any 3D game on any other 8-bit computer? Like, how does yeah. how does this compare to those? I wonder. Um, honestly, it's except for you can't hit nothing. Uh, it's pretty equivalent to uh, a uh, game on the Atari 8-bit. All right. I mean, the scene and settings and graphics are different, but the same basic gameplay. Well, well Nick, that sounds like a challenge to make it better. <laughs> yeah. I, uh... yeah. yeah um, uh, to all those uh, uh, game hackers out there and script kitties, uh, can we get an aimbot for this? <laughs> I just want to point out, although I'm absolutely crap at this game, um, I like the fisheye because the you can see the curve going past your shoulder, so to speak, out of your view to the left and right. So you kind of have more information than the screen could actually show. If it was a straight line, you wouldn't know where the corner was, but because it's sort of curved. I don't know that this, this, this yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And quite honestly, I like the way it's, it's once you get used to it, I actually like the way it is. And because of how quote unquote cartoonish it is, it doesn't bother my uh, vertigo very much. So I was able to play for quite a bit. Um, I played for a good 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes at a time with, with uh, very minimal problems. So, I mean, I, I agree this, I do like the way the, the 3D is done on this. And Sloopy, if you want, um, rather than using an aim bot, just uh, take a marker and just draw crosshairs on your screen. Cause you can't move the gun around, you're always shooting in exactly the same place, so. I, I would shoot right at them and I wouldn't hit them. I, it's because you think, didn't draw crosshairs on your screen. Uh, I think I think this game is a uh, stormtrooper emulator. <laughs> Never thought of that. I should have put a piece of like painter's tape on my screen. I was just going to suggest you use a permanent marker, then it's always ready anytime. <laughs> exactly, you want to play game crasher. That's what I'm saying. Uh, now I, I'm I'm waiting to see these uh, CM8s on uh, eBay say they're gate crasher ready with that mark on them. <laughs> Actually, like the Vetrix with the uh, screen overlay thing, you make one for your Coco. It has the pre-done, uh, you know, crosshairs. Yeah, it might not have a door, but it's got a, it's got a, a rec, uh, what do they reticle, call it? reticle for uh, gate crasher. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new product, the uh, shooteroo for you there. <laughs> I, I should mention too, there's multiple that. comments on the live stream and even after the fact of, of how good the flames on the opening screen look, the credit screen. Yeah, the fire, the fire looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. It's fantastic. It's incredible. <laughs> Flame on. That's right. Flame on. <laughs> and there was, my last... of, uh, there was a lot of uh, get to the chopper comments while we were playing. That's <laughs> right. And my last comment about the uh, the whole show is I've to asked many people about the, um, the intro uh, graphic. And people are like, what intro graphic? So since everybody starts late, I figured I would show them. This is what it looks like when you when the show first starts streaming. Live, we'll be playing Gate Crasher by Nick Morantes. Now that you only play on the uh, the disc, that on the live YouTube. Yeah, I start the stream with this because I found that people didn't start until like five ten minutes after I started streaming. And to reduce the amount of time of just me sitting there, I put this up so that people know that it's about to start. That way they get their notification and they can get whatever they're doing and get to watching. It makes sense. Right. Perfect. So, and you're yet another one of them streamers going, are we on yet? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone here? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cause uh, I, I like to have the audience members. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, then you're on the wrong show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't care if we have to do a weekend at Bernie's type setup where we have a bunch of people that are 
Let's yeah. just say they're, they're not exactly 100% living, but at least having them sit there watch, I mean, I'm good with that. I'm not too picky. We rate very high with cats and dogs. That too. Ow. Oof, that was rough. All right. Good, good so, times. And thanks for doing that, Sloopy. Yeah. I, I like that. And idea. back to you, Ken. Okay. Well, um, because next weekend is Christmas, so I'm told. <laughs> Um, Do you guys celebrate the, that in Canada, or is that just an American holiday? Um, we started. We've we've started. We took it on the uh, tradition. You've adopted that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah normally, we celebrate Boxing, Boxing Day. Day. Yeah. Boxing Day. Where everybody in the family puts on boxing gloves, and you just get to punch, <laughs> punch each other. Well, other. So well, didn't you get uh, me a better gift? And yeah, that type of thing. I thought you just put everyone in boxes and give them away. I like that idea. Ooh. <laughs> 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 anyway, so um, we do have two games for this uh, next two weeks. I did say I was going to put an adventure game in there, but honestly, I just completely ran out of time and did not have time to figure one out. So I will... Oh, got to share my screen first. Double header. Double, double. Double down. We're playing Mac Os 10? Oh, Dun, sorry. Da -da. <laughs> oh, and here in the wrong star. color set... Ooh. <laughs> This is Thexter. It's the sexy version of Thexter. This of, is uh, Thexter. And does it matter if we play the, Nit the Nitrous Nine EOU version or if we well, play the? Well, I was going to say let's let's not forget that we can actually play this on the Nitrous Nine Ease of Use uh, project. It's there, so you can play it there, or you can uh, get your own copy, or if you have the cartridge, you can play this. Uh, copy right here. Ooh, I got a cartridge of this. So do I. So. I got a whole box and a cartridge. It's the first game I've ever I ever ran into where I got a copy of it, tried it. I didn't have a Coco Three yet, tried it, and I thought, oh, this cartridge doesn't work. So I didn't know you couldn't play it on the Coco Two, but figured that out later on. Good thing you kept it because some people have done that and sold it off, then thinking it was defective. Yeah, well, yeah, I've got a lot of defective cartridges that I've just hung on to in case I need the cases or something, or someday I will take them apart and try to fix them. Okay, so that's game number one. Ooh. Ooh. Game number two. Ooh. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, 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 cool. Oh, Dragon Slayer. Dragon Slayer. Oh, yeah. that, that's a cool one. Yeah. So, oh, and an Dragon artifact Slayer. goodness. Dragon Slayer. In all of its glory. So That's a big game, too. I would like to see how far some of the people get in that. Mm -hmm. There's 160 screens, I think, if I remember correctly. Wow. Huge. Ty, I, I just love how you have to go, you'd have to go all the way back to the beginning to pick up one thing because you can only carry one, one thing, at, thing a at a time. Or you yes, just move I, them from screen to screen as you're going. Oh, just as tedious. <laughs> okay. And just so people know, um, because of next week being the uh, the, uh, the holiday, and uh, I guess we're not going to have a show next week. If right. I remember, well, certainly. just I just want to remind yeah. because I don't think It'll anybody. It'll be a clip show. I, I yeah. had I had asked everybody, or I just put out a general call, if people would like to submit us some clips, and we yes. could run a sizzle reel of of stuff. You know, people saying what they were thankful for from this year, or what they're looking forward to next year, anything like that. Happy holidays, anything. Yeah. So I, it'd be neat if we could come up with a community reel. Of people sending us clips about stuff that we could air on Christmas Day. So if people would like to send us stuff, I would splice it all together and run something that we could just run out. Um, and, you know, if that doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, uh, depending right. on, uh, depending on, I know a lot of people will be out of town or with family and this and that and the other, but um, there is a chance that once Christmas is over at the Strobridge house with, you know, the kids of, unwrap their gifts and blah 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 and now they're back to they don't care about us anymore i might be able to do a spontaneous <laughs> um a spontaneous something or another christmas day too uh even though we might not have a full panel maybe we could still do something so it's as anything's possible but i would love to yeah. have some community content we could just run as a reel you know some okay. ha happy happy joy joy stuff you know so submit your right. uh community real thing that you want to be shown on christmas day people come on yeah man yeah oh, keep yeah. your real okay. real oh yeah. yeah yeah so how do we submit that okay uh you can send it to us on discord you can send it to an email at coco talk at coco talk live you could send it with a self-addressed stamp envelope 
Um, and then we'll talk about too late for carrier pigeon. Yeah, yeah. Smoke signals, uh, wax, uh, wax cylinder would be another method of doing that. Uh, paper tape, you can submit it on paper tape. We'll, we'll accept that. Uh, well, punch RFC cards. 11. Punch cards, sure. Yeah. RFC eleven forty nine. Uh, that's fine too. Forty nine is good. I've one. got okay. these old eighty column punch cards. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. As, as I was saying, um, our show, our game one will continue on Thursdays, and um, the uh, next week we will be uh, focusing uh, on playing Thexter, hmm. and then the following week we will be focused on playing this game, Dragon Slayer. Dragon Slayer. Dragon yes. Slayer. Um, so that we're not like burnt out by playing both on the same same day. So you will you can play either one on either day, but we will be trying to focus on Thexter um, this coming Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday between Christmas and New Year's, we will be uh, focusing more on Dragon Slayer. Now this is I got a question. This is a challenge for Samuel Gimes now to come up with some type of crossover mashup song parody that addresses both games too. Sorry, Ron, go ahead. I have a serious question here. Okay. Um, what do the dragon people feel about this game? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Ron. They they for them? For them? I believe well, this it's... game was originally on the dragon, so... Uh, oh, ironically, no, it it's in Artifact Colors. Yeah, yeah I don't think comics. it was a British game. Well, oh, it's a, yeah, Dragon Slayer is available on the dragon? Maybe I should play it on my dragon. On that, one, like, on that one, they call it Coco Slayer. So. Ah. <laughs> well, and Thursday, Thursday is a holiday of sorts. It's the day before Christmas Eve, or it's uh, Festivus, so oh, we can oh, yeah. we can uh, we can bring out the metal metal pole and uh, air our grievances during the game on stream. I don't know if oh, I want to do that oh, though, because David oh. Ladd, if he brings a metal pole, he might start dancing. That kind of scary. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're not playing, <laughs> we're not playing Joust or Lancer mm. or Buzzard Bait, so no oh, pole. me closer, tiny Lancer. You know, next Saturday yeah, I'm gonna but... start my Christmas shopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you shopping at the gas station? Seven <laughs> Eleven at midnight on Christmas Eve. You're getting air fresheners for Christmas. <laughs> That's right. Everybody loves jerky. <laughs> If you wait till Sunday, there'll be great prices on stuff. Uh, ooh, and I also, I also wanted to mention that uh, because this all ends on New Year's Eve, I will be ending the uh, submission time a little earlier because I don't want to be sitting here at uh, 12 o'clock on New Year's Eve getting everything ready for the show on January 1st. So it'll be around noon my time that I'll be ending it. So That's Canadian time. So you double yeah, it. Yeah, Canadian uh, Pacific time. Yeah. So when's the next real so, talk? talk, talk how's, that's January that's like, 1st. Did you say noon February Pacific, 1st? So that's 3 o'clock. January 1st. January. 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 Yeah. Well, I will try to do something Christmas Day. An ad, an ad, an ad hack impromptu <coughs> Coco Talk, which would be completely different from any other Coco Talk. It's not ad hoc or impromptu. Yeah, because uh, these are all so well scripted. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Also, just for those wondering if they want to play it on real hardware, um, Thexter, if you have the cartridge, is a 128K Coco 3 game. <clears throat> if you're playing it off of disc, I think it needs 512 and it definitely needs 512 to be running under Nitro Sun. Dragon Slayer is a Coco 1, 2, or 3, and it only requires 32K. And if you're wondering how to load it up on um, Nitrous 9, uh, actually, I think I did that in my first video i actually loaded this game up so you know a plug for my channel so yeah go to launch a g I'm gonna, show i'm gonna do a, i'm gonna do a video about loading the rom pack version there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll get right on that all right oh let and, me and know no when cheating you on the it. nitrous nine one because you can skip levels and give yourself infinite lives a bunch of other stuff if, if you read the help but just play it the standard yes oh i'm waiting for that cartridge uh how to because i've yeah. never been able to yeah. play mine because um, i don't know how to use it i'll get on, i'll get on that uh after the show all right i'll Thank put it you. i'll put it up on my channel i'll let you know it's going to be a 25 part series though so it might yes, not be done for you know we now go on with our 25 part series of how to load some, hero, pack. Yeah, yeah. some heroes don't wear pack. capes <laughs> what well, do you have an episode for every pin on the cart or something or what? <laughs> that would be 40 part then wouldn't it and then using the multi-pack. 
Oh yes, that that's that is a that's a spin-off series on how to load it yeah, from the multi pack. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Well, we have our games. We have our stuff. Um, so I think already... we should do some more game stuff. Well, we steady. do. We need. We have some game on news. I'm wondering if we should take a break. Um, Ron, do we need to take a break? We can. But okay. Terry Steggy, aren't you using that black computer back there? Yeah, I am. Oh, okay, okay. Looks like it's Mothball just sitting there. Okay, so <laughs> Curtis Bill, you have some game on news, do you not? Yes, I do. <laughs> also, it... Stevie, I don't know, did you get a chance to watch last week's episode? Because we had kind of an update on a bunch of game projects. I did not. I did not. Okay, because there was a few people that couldn't make it, so actually we have some updated videos from them, so there's some game update projects on oh. today's Ooh. Updates to the updates. Okay. Dragon content was heavy with this one. Hmm. Okay, so uh, what do we want to do? you want to take a break before you do the Game On News, or you want to just roll into Game On News? I think yes. I'll just roll into that, then we'll take a break before the real news. Oh, okay. okay. I'm going to tell you right news. now, I'm going to need to take a break to make a pot of coffee or I'm not going to make it through the show. Uh, I've been doing, I've been teaching night classes and I'm ready to melt in this chair here. So uh, mm -hmm. I need a, I need some point in time where I can take a break to start the coffee pot. So well, we'll don't do you it. usually sleep through the news anyway? Well, I want to think you're getting <laughs> and that Mikey <laughs> drugs a lot faster. You just yes. pop so um, so we're, we're going to we're going to keep the game on news rolling. And then I guess we'll take a break after game on news so I can make some. Yeah, coffee. there's only eight. So that's not too many. OK, roll on. So L. Curtis Boyle. Take it away. L. Curtis okay. Boyle. Game on news with L. Curtis Boyle, everybody. OK, you guys seeing that? Coco Bond from Redbeard. Yes, Paul Fair. So he is actually one of the people we invited on for our big, you know, Christmas game update, game project update. He wasn't able to make it last week because he was actually ill. Um, but he did put out a video here. So he kind of goes a big explanation here. And he's kind of got some animations now. Even on the hey screen, there, you can everybody. see the little box Welcome going around. And the Coco Bon. I'm going to talk about it. But I'll just fast forward a bit here to show some of the actual game play as he's got now. So you got the game save slots. You can save game save progress. Healthy, yes. All right. So there I am up in the left-hand corner. And next to me is what's called the gem slot. Um, that you move these little gems into and when all of them are filled with gems this lock right here will disappear um, and then this key deactivates this lock and this lock right here is done by lasers lasers so these will emit lasers, Freaking lasers and they will stop at gems um, and they will stop at walls and they will stop at mirrors, but they can reflect off of mirrors if you have the angled side towards the laser. Um, and then the lasers go into these receptacles. And there's four in this level, so you'd have to get the laser into each one. And then this lock will um, unlock. Wow. That's a crazy puzzle. <clears throat> um, yeah. So these spaces right here are what I call the death space. So right now they're blank. But as soon as you step into them, a skull and crossbones will show up behind you. You step out, and if you step on that space again, you will explode, and the, the level will restart. Which is the only thing I have left to do in movement. Um, and it's the next thing I'm going to do, because if you push the R key, um, it does the same thing. It'll blow you up and then restart the level um, from the beginning. Um, but it will not go back in time. Your time stays the same all the time. Um... So I just wanted to play that because some people we've shown this this game before in screenshots and other videos, but it hasn't it really had a good explanation of what what's involved in the gameplay. So he did a really good explanation here of what the different pieces do and what different puzzles you'll have to solve. So it's it's quite a good puzzle game. Like when he first showed it, you know, a year ago when he started it, it was it looked more like a Sokoban clone with a couple of better graphic bits here. But he's got you know teleporter portals and all this gem stuff and lasers and stuff. So it's much more sophisticated than Sokoban. So I'm I'm really looking forward to. Uh, to seeing it when it's done here, but he's been making and it's got a really cool look to it as well. It's yeah. cerebral. Cerebral. Yeah. Is it a cerebellum? It reminds me a lot more like a photon with the colors and the shapes and stuff. Mm. Solving puzzles. Yeah. You know, if you're into puzzle games, I know like Frodo NL, for example, is hugely into those types of things. So that would be this would be the type of game for you. Anyway, he's got more in the update there. He's got some of the coding stuff he's kind of mentioning before and stuff too, and, and more in the gameplay and graphics design. And it'll have a built in level editor. You can create your own levels too, if you mm. want to share them with people afterwards. So. 
Next up, Paul Shoemaker. Um, he's done poker squares now for the Coco 3s, he's done it for the Coco VGA, standard Coco with artifact graphics. He just realized I forgot the dragon. They don't have artifact color, so now he's doing a Colors. P-Mode 3 version of it. He hasn't got too far, but he's actually got the sound card support in here too, so you'll be able to get a clip of the opening screens, title screens and stuff, credit screens, as well as some of the music. Ooh. You see Dragon Edition with the Dragon Dragon logo. Edition with the Dragon Logos. This guy is too damn talented. Makes me sick. <laughs> Those playing cards look like they've aged a bit. Right, it's the guy who drew all the cards. Dude, that so, I mean, that's awesome. really cool. He's making that dragon specific one because I know the dragon people sometimes get you know a little bit left out because we're so concentrating on Coco 3s, etc. So it's uh, nice okay. that he's actually creating a version specifically for them. Show the dragon some love. Oh, yeah. The next up, this is a bit of a teaser. So this is uh, Tim Thayer, Paul's brother, part of the Coco Brothers, <clears throat> who hasn't been doing much on the game side on the Coco here for a bit. He, he did a bunch of card games with Paul before uh, in you know the 2010s type thing. <clears throat> but he put this little teaser coming soon from Coco Brothers, and you can just kind of see this blurry screenshot. Oh, I thought, I thought I, obviously I thought a Coco Three game, given all the colors. I thought my glasses were just smudgy or something. Yeah, so that's a... yeah. Or I thought you drank too much. It's yeah. Too, oh, so, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's a teaser coming soon from Coco Brothers. No other description. He hasn't commented on it because I think he wants to surprise people with it. Uh, I do know a little bit about this project. I'll mention it's actually both of them working on it. I think Tim's more the designer and Paul's the programmer on this one, though they can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But uh, definitely a Coco 3 game, judging by the colors. And then uh, other than that, I can't really tell you. But my Mark Overhoser visor on, it's still out of focus. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my bubbles glasses there. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> I love the teases. So anyway, combined with the other five project updates we had last week, that's, uh, what, eight other game projects that are ongoing, as well as a wow. few others we didn't bother mentioning because there's been no updates, but they're still being worked on, including a couple I'm involved with. So there's a there's a bunch of games uh, being worked on, I'd say, you know, a dozen at least that I know of at this point. Uh, so next up, we get the Jim Gary part of the show here. <clears throat> so this is part of another John Crutch game. This one's from 1981, as you can see here. This is from his book, Experiments in Artificial Intelligence, done way back in 81. So there, he's covered a few of these before, you know, very primitive versions of AI. And uh, this one here is called King's Move or King's King Move. And it's kind of a chess style. I don't know if you'll be able to read all this, but it's a three by three board. And it's basically um, a kind of a strategy game. I'm trying to remember, there's another one called Knights something or other that's a, kind of along this line too, though it has more squares on the screen, but basically it's a strategy AI thing of trying to solve and moving pieces around here, so. That's a, is I, that a, like the female male symbol thing or what is that? Is that? Is... <laughs> that could be the king or the queen or something, I guess. I'm not sure. Hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a huge chess player, so I couldn't really tell you. Yeah, typically the king has a little... Uh, cross on his hat. Okay. Crown. okay. Uh, next up, and this is another new one, like as we mentioned last week. Um, this is Paris Arat, AGD. Paris, Paris Arat and his partner, I'm trying to remember the guy's name again. Ben something. Key, ben. Keys Van, Key, yeah, Key Van Oss and Paris Arat. It says it right there on yeah. the screen, yeah. Oh, Keys well, Van yeah. Oss, yes. Thanks for making me look like an idiot. Yeah, but, no, you yeah, did a good job you. all by yourself. I just. Uh, I know. Yeah. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> so anyway, they've, they've been working on basically all the AGD games that have been updated on the Spectrum side of things over the last couple of years since they last released all these packs. They're going to be releasing six packs of games every week for nine weeks straight. Dear this God. is the uh, pack number 42 because they're continuing them from the original ones that they did. And we covered this last week with some other ones. So I thought we'd just quickly scroll through the six here. You can see the titles here. Dan, Terrific 3, Defeat the Devil, Dragonfire, which is actually a port of Dragonfire by a Magic. I remember oh, wow. the Spectrum and now back to the Dragon. Uh, Dungeon Run, Spider Mammy, and the Curse of Trasmos. So Spider Mammy. Here's Dragon, Dragon Fire. Fire. Ooh, look at that. That is gorgeous. Roar. There it is. That looks like the 2600 version a little bit, though. Yeah, a little bit. Not the Here's the version. treasure room. Oh, yeah. Very 2600. Now, the engine's definitely, uh, you know, it's not meant to be curved and stuff, and it's not meant for color because it's uh, color. PAL, but. Oh, yeah. 
What if I put it on composite? Would I see colors then? Uh, you see color fraying, I would guess. Okay. It's, not, it's not designed for color. And don't forget, people can go through these games and uh, suggest them for the game on challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, with all these nine packs of six games apiece, there's over 50 games coming out over the you know span of two months. That would be um, something that probably none of us have seen or played before, so that would be good. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It'd be a fair one for everybody. And then also, no. I mean, people can go through all these and kind of pick a couple of the best ones. Now, the only downside is, is that Nick Marentes has no way of profiting from this. <laughs> <laughs> no Ferraris in his future. Yes. Especially a prof- a profiting from the free game that we played last week. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> He yeah, for those who didn't catch it earlier, Gate Crasher was released to the, you know, freeware ah. a couple years back. So, mm. it's also a bonus feature on some of the uh, the CD right. sets you buy. An alleged bonus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you're thinking Nightmare Highway. <laughs> I like this. The kind of a, a ghouls and ghosts looking thing here. You got the little guy down there, pumpkin guy running around. Yeah, I guess I misread that because I thought it was Dan Terrifics, and it's more it's more like Dante. Riffics. Now, does this guy have a freaking swastika on his uh, yep. collar there? Well, it's kind of a hell thing, I think, and that okay. kind of fits. The Dark Age of Grotesque. Wow. It's one of the darker-themed AGD games I've seen. Okay, right? wow. Fair. Wow, look at this. Man. The graphics are really cool on it, though. I like it. Yep. Welcome Here's to Defeat, Defeat the Devil. The Devil. Coded by the one and only, and I don't even want to try to pronounce his first name. Uh, is a is a uh, fiddle involved in this process here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then went down to Georgia. That's right. Yeah. Saw this young boy sawing on a fiddle and playing a hot. Jumped up on a hickory stump. Said, "Boy, let me tell you what." All right, they, man. The graphics in this are then they all astounding. attended boat fest in West Virginia. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> this is astounding. <laughs> astounding visuals on this one here. <laughs> Pretty sure I'm we're guessing this is by younger guy. Infr- yeah. Infringements on this episode. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, this is Dungeon Run. Dungeon Run. Run, Dungeon Run. With directions. Oh. This looks more like your Pixel Perfect style, okay. you know, Jet Set Willy, Manic Miner style Escape game. I don't know if it is. I'm the trying dungeon. to get. Spider Mammy. Ooh, Spider I do like that title screen. Yes, I do too. I don't know if I'd put hearts beside a spider, but okay. You know, it's the mom, and those are the babies down there. They're loving their mom up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's Spider Mammy. I'm not sure what the goal of this game is, but I guess the mommy has to get food to bring back to the babies. I'm not sure. I don't. Could be. Okay. And what the hell's going on here? This is Trasmoz. Okay. You got a dude holding a torch and a sword. Okay, the Sorry, curse, the curse of, of Trasmos. Trasmos. Ooh, like the font. Okay, very spectrumy looking type games though. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, it makes sense. I mean, AGD is a spectrum yeah, based. Yeah. So anyway, like I said, uh, the the plan. I've, I've talked to Per a little bit on the World of Dragon archive, and he's actually got nine of these packs. They'll be released weekly, uh, including through the holidays. So yeah. I think this was the second week. So look forward to seven more of these packs coming up. And then, as Ken mentioned, uh, maybe we should have a few people kind of go through them, pick some of the best ones, and we'll put them in the Game on Challenge. There you go. Hey. Beauty, eh? Next up, and uh, I'll just show it here first. So this is the Japanese site oh, that did a bunch of the MC10 oh, and yeah. uh, Coco ports. Now, up till now, the Coco, I think, had seven games on here, and the MC10 had six. So the last one has been ported, and it's called Maisie. Amazing. And of course, it's running a slightly lower res. It's running P mode one instead of P mode three, but it's another machine language game for the MC10. And since it's only 41 second clip, I thought I'd play it. And you guys can see it. And it's available for download. It's a beauty. Maisie. Well, it's got a Night Stalker look to it. You've got some scrolling going on there. The yep. May- four look at scrolling. that. I'm going to have to declare and say that's amazing. Absolutely is. Is sure. that a lobster chasing you? Yeah, there's two different monsters that uh, you have to deal with. That's the one that chases you, and there's another one up there. That's Mr. Godly Goop. And you have to get to the exit door. Get to the chopper. 
That's right. And doors and everything else. So it's a, it, it looks like a pretty fun game. I don't know how many levels are in it. it requires a 16K RAM expansion. Yeah, that's good. The speed was really good, especially for an MC10. The scrolling. Yeah. And and I, I've been, I'm trying to remember, has there been any other scrolling games besides maybe Flagonbird that I've, on the MC10? I don't remember any. Okay. I like it. I like what we're doing here. I yeah. like it. So anyway, if you go on to our Discord channel, you can grab the link or from the, the news summary channel one of the five billion channels if you can find it you can tell me where it is is um, nightmare highway on the mc10 i don't believe so not that, that i'm aware of mm, it needs to be yeah <laughs> yeah not an I, mc10 project but it but could, it could be. be yes yeah. mm -hmm. well you talked about scrolling and that's what yeah. i thought of yeah at any rate as as all the other ones here if you've got some of these other retro machines including you know spectrums and stuff like that zx 81s etc there's a ton of machines some of them were unique to japan uh but there's ports for all kinds of things from apples to everything else too so that is if neat. you have lots of retro machines you can get the, this game and the other ones is the same people seeing made. the various versions yeah, of for it. various ones and, yeah. and there some of them are quite different looking and some are tile based so they move like a tire block that's actually a fairly smooth one for the mc10 with four-way scrolling too which is not something i've seen before on the mc10 Baby, I'm amazed at the way. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, seriously Chris's Chris's Retro Corner. Now we covered his channel last week because he uh, got a Dragon Thirty Two for Christmas from his wife. Now, how many people here have had their wives get them a retro system that they weren't expecting? Apparently, it was a surprise to him. Um, I, I well, you know, I was really surprised when his wife sent me one too because I didn't even know her. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> So anyway, he did the video last week where he kind of just opened it up, showed you what everything was bundled with it. Because it wasn't just the dragon. It was a dragon with a bunch of original game cassettes Ooh. and stuff with directions and everything else. So his first of three videos that he's done so far as of this morning, <clears throat> the first one is basically took some requests. He took the top three requests from people that watch his channel. Out of all the games he showed that he got with this in the bundle, uh, which ones did you want him to play? Now, he's got one problem. His dragon, the one key doesn't work. Every other key in the keyboard works. So, you know, some of it doesn't play all that well, but he got Chucky Egg, Cuthbert in Space, and Caterpillar Attack. And these are his first reactions. He's never played a dragon before, never saw a dragon before. So I'm not going to play because he's got like multiple videos, but we'll just kind of go through which ones he's got. So that was his first video from about the middle of the week where he did the user's choice. And then after that, he started picking, uh, I guess he's done this before in previous years with other machines. I think he said he did the Vic 20 last year, but basically right before Christmas, he goes through 10 games for a particular system for the 10 days of Christmas type thing. So he's done the first two episodes of that here. <clears throat> the first one he did here is a game called uh, Mind Out, which is a low res game, which I'm not familiar with. I don't think I'd seen it before, but apparently from comments, both in the Dragon Facebook page, where he posted a link to this as well, um, and some other Dragon people have played it. It's actually a fun game, but it's basically text and seven graphics for <clears throat> so he played that one, and I'll just fast forward a bit into the actual gameplay. And it's it's kind of reminds me a little bit of like Minesweeper type things. You have to kind of like guess your way through, and it'll tell you, you know, how many surrounding squares have a mine you want to try to avoid. So I'll just play a little bit of it. Okay. So those are the safe zones. Top and bottom. Let's let's get going. Say one mine. There is a copy of this game on the Color Archive because I played it just the other day. Mines. I can't remember what it was called though. Oh, okay. The archive. And is it basic completely, or is it basic and ML? You know, I can't remember. I was just going through a bunch one of stuff mine, looking so. for games for the game mm. on, and I ran across this one and played it for a little bit. I mean, if you're into the Minesweeper type games, like sort of the maze puzzle games, it actually looks pretty good. I mean, it's you know not high res or anything, but. And it's got some pretty decent effects I'm when you, you know, complete levels and stuff here. I'll just fast forward a little bit. Yes. I mean, that's a safe zone there. Yay! Did it! Excellent stuff. Right, level one. We'll get a speed bonus as well. That's kind of it. And it shows you where all the mines were and then your path through. All right. Should, should, should that not have said three mines around there? Although I suppose you couldn't have got to that one. Oh wow! Brilliant yeah, stuff. that's got to yeah, be pretty, some machine pretty language. Fancy looking for a basic game. I was yeah, impressed. that's got to be some machine driving. language thing. Ooh, mystery bonus. That's cool. Well, then you get some mystery things and stuff yeah. too. So it looks like a pretty decent little game. 
mystery bonuses under that, which could be mines. So, <laughs> <clears throat> yay! It's a bonus mine. <laughs> and the next one here, of course, is one of my favorites of all time, which is Phantom Slayer, which he Ooh. he talks about the mood in the game and everything else too. Now, of course, his one key is broken, so he can't pick the easiest speed level. He has to pick the middle one, two. And he can't pick the easy maze level where you get a nice long hallway. So you have to pick level two because his one key is broken. So he gets a complicated maze with faster phantoms. So he was kind of like, you know, a bit screwed off a start. Also, I I'd kind of forgotten the uh, micro deal version of it here for the dragon actually has directions built into the game, which the Coco version did not. You got a little printed sheet with it instead. So that was a little bit different. But of course, it's, you know, the standard game itself. And I won't play it here because I've played Phantom Slayer stuff way too often on the channel because I'm a huge fan. But, but it's, it's interesting he's doing those. I don't know what his next eight games are doing. He's been releasing them roughly like in the afternoon, early evening, hour time each day. So there's another one due today. And then he's got, you know, seven more days after that. So if you want to you know, pick up some possible gems you may not have seen before and, and see somebody that's brand new to the dragon react to them, it's a pretty, pretty fun channel to follow. And he's been posting them in the dragon Facebook group as well, links to his YouTube channel. And then the last one for the game on news today, Eric Montero. Now, last week we covered um, a few people, including Jim Gary, had, had taken this challenge of a 1K Spectrum game, which was a Space Invader game. Only one invader at a time because it had to fit 1K. Um, so people have been, you know, duplicating on the MC10 or the Coco, uh, you know, spicing up a little bit of color and stuff. Erico decided to go a little bit past that. He's actually he's world famous for doing his animations with very low res that look, you know, really good for uh, low res type stuff. So he's he's kind of broken the 1K barrier at this point. He's been adding in some sound effects, etc. And I thought I'd just play the whole 45 second clip because it it looks pretty cool for a low res game and sounds pretty good too. I'm presuming he's using the play command for the sound. That's way too fast for the sound command. But yeah, the ships kind of like spin around a little bit and, you know, better explosions than the original too. So, and there's little pickup things. So he's kind of expanding on the original game concept. It's good. Anyway, it's cool to say, you know, taking a very, very simple game concept that was really done on the Spectrum, some other people converted to the Coco and MC10, threw in some of the semi-graphic color, and now he's kind of like just taking that the next step further type thing and, and then putting in animations and adding to the gameplay too with pickups and things too. So that's I thought that was pretty cool. And that's the end of the game on news this week. So if you wanted to do the old break and get some coffee there, Stevie, go for it. I'm going to grab some myself. All right. We're going to take a break and we'll be back after these words. We've been, just been joined by Patrice Tremblay uh, on Facebook who asked a question, in your opinion, who was the best programmer of Coco Games? So that might be a little discussion topic we can have when we come back from the break. It's, uh, you know, part of it's going to be definitely opinion based, but um, it's always interesting to hear people weigh in on that. So for our commercial break, we're going to run with a little Fletcher, and we'll be back after these words, kids. Hey there, I'm Marco Rolzer, and you're watching Coco Talk. Fletcher, I don't need that report tomorrow. Great, JT. I need it tonight. But, JT... Fletcher saved $300 on her office away from the office. Radio Shack's revolutionary Model 100 computer. It's a word processor, phone directory, and dialer. It even communicates with the office computer. Fletcher, how's that report? Fletcher. Radio Shack's Model 100. Save $300 and put it to work. You'll go far, Fletcher. Oh, <laughs> you'll go far. What is love? And now, Coco Thoughts by Samuel Gimes. On holidays, Uncle JT would entertain us with stories of his business conquests and his assistant who would meet any deadline that he imposed, no matter how ridiculous. Well, until she shot him in the face, that is. Hi, this is the award-winning Alan Huffman of Subbeat the Software, and you're watching Stevie Fall Off Cliffs. 
What's going on, guys? Stevie Stroh here, and I want to say thank you so much for being part of this adventure with us. It's been such a great experience in doing Coco Talk every week, and the support we get is just amazing. And so the fact that you watch and listen is all the reward that we need. However, if you would like to become a patron of the show and offer some financial assistance towards the production and hosting costs of the show, we do have a Patreon site available for that, and you can reach that by going to our website at Coco Talk live and clicking on the patreon link but just do us a favor and watch and listen to the show this is not the joey serial switch this is the Joey Serial Switch. Control up to three serial devices. Order yours today at cocoman.biz. Radio Shack, America's technology store. Right! This Christmas, Tandy has a very special offer. A family color computer pack to take away at a very special price. This family computer comes complete with software and costs an incredible $449, a saving of $241.69. It's powerful, educational, and ideal for the young and young at heart. The easy way to start computing. The color computer family pack from Tandy. Get it while it's hot. Tandy, the biggest electronic store in Australia. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tim. Playing dagger with like that idiot from the book. <laughs> You're watching Coco Talk. From around the world, what you need to know. Get caught up on news with El Curtis. A new a Muppet News Flash. Okay, well, we're supposed to be doing the news, but then we also just decided we having this kind of impromptu discussion on um so i don't know if we want to use the word best programmer for games but maybe we can all weigh in on who our favorite is because best is kind of subjective and there's all kinds of factors that and it doesn't in. have to just be for games uh yeah true that right so there is um yeah so the the uh, the question came from patrice tremblay saying in your opinion who was the best programmer of coco's games Oh, and, in these games? Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the question. Okay. Who wrote Color Script Set? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that Script well, Set is, is just Color amazing. Script Set a game? There's another discussion. Well, we haven't had it on the Game On Challenge yet. <laughs> yet. Oh, that's my, you spoiled my surprise for the first game of 2022. <laughs> I thought that one was going to be near the beginning of April. It right. is so, an entertaining title. I mean, there's a few names that come to mind that would sound very cliche, but also appropriate. Like, so Steve Bjork, if there's a top 10 of legendary game programmers, Steve Bjork would have to be on that list because he's just done so much, his body of work. But someone else who's been equally as prolific has been somebody like Greg Zumwalt, who's done a lot of things. And then we've got a lot of the guys from, like, uh, 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 Dave Dyes and you know uh spectral associates and then glenn dahlgren so yeah i think we're all going to have our favorites but it's a great uh great discussion so guys chime in weigh in let the audience the audience it, it's a tough one for me because i mean how do you measure that i mean do you measure it by you know prol prolific like steve would definitely be up there on the prolific side of things uh quality um pushing the limits right the jeremy machine. spiller was mentioned by tim thayer yeah um Jeff Steidel is another one that might be right. up there, that type of thing. Um, originality is another one. Like for some people, you know, they, who can do the best arcade clones type thing. But for other people, it's like, you know, who did something unique that's only on the Coco and never showed up anywhere else? And isn't even based on gameplay from some other arcade game or a port from another machine. Like sometimes the originality is something like that's where I put Ken Kalish up. He did right. do some clones, but he did a lot of good original games. Yeah, too, so. yeah Ken Kalish. What if um, we pull all the programmers? Well, we should pull everybody because not, you know, gameplay is done by everybody, not just programmers. Right. In fact, us programmers usually suck at playing games. So. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, so a lot of the Mark Data products were all really cool. Some, all the Tom Mix stuff was good. Spectral Associates, Spectral and those, Associates, were, yeah. those weren't always the same programmer. But Icom, uh, Sundog, Mark Shaw yeah. with it, Mark Shaw had some unique things where most of his games were uh, white background with black foreground. So the different kind of high res, like uh, when you think of like Touch Tomb and uh, Shock Trooper, how those things looked. Computer Shack Mictron with like Mictron. Time Bandit and Cash Man. And, and then the games like Fang Man and, and uh, what, what was the famous name for that one? Bandit A or Bandito or what Bandit O? El Bandito. Somebody, yeah, El Bandito, right? So uh, with the ants pulling in the, the fruit. So uh, yeah, I, it, it's, it's really hard. I couldn't I could not pick a favorite myself or, right, or a right. best per se because it depends on what, what my – your whim at the time is right 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 and uh, yeah so but i'm sure we all got our favorites for sure what about our favorite uh, game that you have to dodge furniture on a highway um <laughs> wow grand morocco grand prix i agree that's a good one yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> nightmare highway is definitely in my top 10 there yes yeah, and Ramon's, that's what? another one yeah you have to dodge that crap and that stupid dog that runs around chris latham is being uh, mentioned who made donkey king and the sailor man Yep. One of my favorites. Um, Although there's the a lot for of uh, original games like Double Back, yeah. Double Back and uh Who programmed Dragon Slayer? So we just mentioned that. Olaf one. Schroeder, Schrader, I think. Ken, yeah. do you know off the top of your head? Uh not off the page. top of my head. I can take a look. Yeah, if so only many. there was a game based Coco based game website that would have this kind well, better, of information. Better yet, one that was on up it. to date. That would be even better. <laughs> <laughs> oh. right, well i mean yeah. and we do and i know he's here and we're not going to just blow smoke but nick morentes has made a lot of quality games especially his newer releases for you know the 21st yeah because his old releases. ones suck so right. especially if you like yeah. games that are really difficult <laughs> yeah like pop star pilots and gunsta and uh, yeah he just blows the money on ferraris yeah. <laughs> yeah i could probably pick my bet my favorite six through nine game uh, gunstar would be that one that's one i could because <laughs> yeah. there's not that many well, of them there's a few uh, Although there's a, a lot of prof prolific uh, programmers and quite a few uh, uh, well-known and excellent games, I can't really pick a specific single programmer that I would consider a favorite because yeah. there's so many different games that I like so many aspects to that picking a single one would be unfair to the others, and sure. I wouldn't want to do that. So literally, I mean, it's... I can pick a list of a bunch of uh, programmers that I that I that I enjoy their works of, but to pick out absolutely one, no, nah, that would be too insulting no. to the people that are further down in the list. That although they're further down in the list, they're no less important or or great than anyone higher on the list. And there's also the thing where there are certain programmers that, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of their games or some of their games. And then there's some of the games from the same exact programmer or programmers that I don't care for. So I can't really pick a favorite. Yeah, right. It's like I like A, B and C, but I don't like, you know, one, two, three that this person did. But, you know, so I yep. just, yeah, it's hard. Well, I want to say of all the games that Steve Bjork made, I think my personal favorite is the Audio Spectrum Analyzer. <laughs> Which version, though? <laughs> the original. Ooh, yeah. The classic. The classic, the classic yes. yes. Not the I, know, I was going to say, like, if you want to pick the most influential game programmer, Steve is probably one of those, because that's one from people that you know got into the Coco a couple years into the Coco. That is one person that is mentioned probably more than anybody else as, uh, you know, why they wanted to write games, because he was so prolific. And I mean, you you can take you know one shot wonders too, like Dungeons and Daggerath. I mean, Douglas yeah. Morgan and the other two that actually worked. I can't remember the names off the top of my head. Sorry, um, but that is one of the most influential games of that genre on any computer platform, and uh, right. that's the only one they ever finished. You know, one thing that's important to me is like oh, I'll use Nick as an example. He uh, he goes online and he actually helps people learn how to program while making these games, and uh, to me, that's huge. Yeah, and he also goes into a lot of discussion on game design, which is something he's really good at. Like he'll he'll tan tweak stuff. Now, obviously, you know when he goes and revisits games he did twenty years ago, he definitely has some different ideas nowadays. Um, you know, this week's game, Gay Crash, was an excellent example where you know back in the day it was <clears throat> we're all younger, we could react faster, and it wasn't as difficult as it seems to be now for everybody. So you know, he definitely would change some of the gameplay mechanics now. But he's very very good with his blog and stuff, explaining you know 
why he changed the level to do this because this old way just didn't quite work right. It's not sucked. not to mention the trash can. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, that's not a game though. That's that's, that's getting into a full blown operating system influence there. <laughs> But I, do, I, do I just have to pick from the uh, like the my favorite classic era, you know, programmers that I've met in person? You know? <laughs> I can only think of maybe three or four at this point. Oh, Alan, thanks for mentioning Keith Kyer Harris because that was the guy who did the main programming for Dagger. That's uh, one of the two names I couldn't remember. One was the art guy, sound guy, and then Doug, and then him. So. Cool stuff. Well. Uh, interesting discussion. I think we've thrown out some names and some ideas. I think everybody's going to have their opinion. It's like anything else. Whenever whenever I have to say, well, who do I want to thank for this or whatever, I'm always going to forget somebody. It's not even on purpose. So it's, uh, the, I guess it's a good problem to have when there are so many uh, games out there and so many game designers that we've had that you can't remember them all. Um, I guess that's a good thing. But um, And I have, a, I have a deep spot in my heart for people that do original games that isn't like a either a straight out clone or so heavily based on something you just added a couple minor tweaks right the people right. that do completely original games that are still fun that's right and um, that's a special yeah. echelon for me that's right true. right right and yes. i would say double back definitely uh, counts as one of those and <clears throat> yeah double back photons another one i would Photon, count as part yeah. of that so amazing world of malcolm mortar that's that's a totally unique one you know it's yeah. not the most graphically sound driven you no, know, but it's showcase cool. of hardware type thing, but it is a fun original game. Absolutely, absolutely. Scripts, it's the best chess game. Yeah, scripts it. What is what is the best donut based what, game? Okay, what 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 <laughs> games involving what your what is your favorite Coco game involving battling dinosaurs? <laughs> what is your favorite Dino Wars? That's a tough one. <laughs> what is your favorite Coco game where you're wandering through a forest that just happens to be full of doom? <laughs> what Enchanted a mess. Forest, yeah, it wasn't too bad. What a mess. <laughs> Didn't somebody win a cup? No, the chalice, I wouldn't know anything about the, that. The, the chalice, um, chalice of douchery, ch chalice of braggadocious. Again, that's that. You know, that's just because you're jealous, and you're gonna, <laughs> you're, gonna you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna make me do it, aren't you? <laughs> and, and you know, um, there's uh, a new emulator class of uh, software writing, for emulator only, probably in your next report, right? Um, I don't know if that's really a class. I mean. It was it was based on Dave doing you know emulating testing on his current engine, but that's based on a hardware card he's actually working on. That's not going to be emulator only. It requires you know his spiced up card to run it afterwards. Well, I'm, so. I'm I'm thinking of Chet's. Yeah, stuff. but we're but we're not allowed to. Uh, we don't talk about certain somebody on the show anymore because of copyright reasons. Oh, okay. Um, so okay. we're moving on. More news, Curtis. Okay, so on to the regular news. Let me get my notes up. Let's go find the right screen here. Okay. Hey, you guys seen that? Guillaume Major. Yeah, so he's the author of SDC Explorer. He's also the host of the Color Computer Archive. So he's working on a new program for the Coco SDC that will let you flash the ROM banks as well. Because, of course, you've got up to seven or eight ROM banks. Move my cat here. Nice. My borrowed cat, anyway. Um, so he's, he's asking for permission to include some games on this that you can flash onto the ROM banks. He's got permission for five right now. He's got Pierre Sarazin's Color 8s, Steve Bamford's Flagon Bird, Evan Wright's Flood It. And then two from John Linville, which is Christmas Rush and Farfall Pandemic Edition. And he's looking for other people to volunteer. And if you respond to this post here on Facebook in the Color Computer Group, if you are an author of some of these games that can be flashed onto the ROM banks, then he can include that then, uh, with this little bundle. And then you can actually instantly boot them up as if they were a cartridge, which is kind is of an interesting an project. Because you've got, what is it, eight, seven or eight banks, I think, on the Coco SDC? And uh, you know, some people use them for alternate DOSs and stuff. But. Is it 8K or 16K banks? Uh, I think it's 16, isn't it? I'm not even sure. I don't know. I should know that off the top of my head, but I, for some reason I'm brain farting on it. If I had to guess, I would say it'd be 8. But I don't know. Disk Extended Basic is on one of them. So what size is that? Is that 8K? Yeah, that's an 8K. I don't know how big SDC DOS is. 
So bank zero, the run at zero is what how you get out of the SDC DOS. So is that a bank or is that just unload the bank? I'm not sure how that works. Um, so I know this extended basic is on one and SDC DOS is on one and then you've got a handful more on there. Yeah, which you can use for other alternate DOSs like A DOS or whatever, or you can or HDB DOS, whatever, or you can put in game cartridges, or you can put in these games that weren't, you know, originally per se cartridge, but can Yeah, be. neat. Some of these actually work hard. Okay, Mikey you just chimed in saying 16K banks. Thank you, Mikey. Okay, cool. So you can fit some fairly decent sized ones then. Okay, so anyway, if you guys have any other authors or that are watching this or on the panel that uh, have games that fit that criteria and are you know able to run from a ROM cartridge, um, submit them up to him and he'll include it on this package when he releases it. Next up, uh, Lord Dragon has updated his chiptunes player now we've covered this before probably about half a year ago and it was basically to use the mega mini mpi the opl3 chip for doing you know all the different sound stuff like a sound blaster and actually playing some of the uh, sound formats for that for playing music etc and he's done a pretty major update here so he's changed the way playlists are done he's added support for both the game master cartridge and the poker psg from uh, ed snyder zipster zone so you've got three different pieces of hardware now that can play these um songs and he's actually got a little video demo here um the first part the first five minutes is basically him just talking about the development of it what he's added and you know how he's changed the way playlists work etc uh which is you know historically interesting but it's, it's not something i want to play on the show you guys can just go watch the video on his page you can also download this immediately by the way but i thought i'd play some of the demo stuff here um which he actually does it playing through the different cards um now is that loud yeah, enough so right, let, me, let me show you uh this in action can't hear so it. Jump over into my directory here. Can you hear it now? And, yeah. Um, I so can't. I made a mix uh, of, of three songs. That I don't hear anything choose, either. Use um, hmm. different devices. Now I can't. I can't mix in OPL stuff in an emulator because uh, Mega doesn't it. emulate. It is uh, going OPL out the stream in the Mega Mini MPI. Yeah, I'm hearing but, it here. Um, you know, it's, so it's not Zoom. it'll have to be this. Uh, I showed you the flags, right? So, so the way that I um, launched MAME for this this demonstration, I I did specify yeah, to skip a little bit already the would here. use the flag GMC, and then slot three, and then you can also specify. Um, oh, whoops! I'm sorry. I meant to do that. Uh, but yeah, you could do that. Um, but if you leave out the flag, it will just use the default. But for this demonstration, um, I'm just going to do the defaults. I will mention he's actually got it. You can select which slot each card is for pro work properly, too, if you have a multi pack. Is the sound being shared through Zoom? Yeah, I hear it. it. Yeah, I hear it, too. No, I'm hearing it. Sounds good. This is on the Coco PSG now. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds really good. So, um, pretty badass. One thing you'll notice is yeah, and the fact that this one player now will actually encompass all these cards is, is pretty cool. Now, I, I'll have to ask Todd, the author, um, if he gets a really complicated track that has more voices than some of these cards can have, because obviously they have different capabilities, um, you know, how does he translate that? Does he just pick some certain, you know, channels that he uses? Maybe you have to use a first well, floor or something like that? Curtis, one of yep. the things about the VGM format is that it supports multiple chips with clock rates and things. But what it's doing is a constant time stream of the actual register values to that chip. So when it says it's playing a 2149 chip tune into a 2149 chip, there it only plays the, the matching tracks because it's actually just playing a register dump. And typically, if your chip supports previous generations, then it plays just fine. But if it doesn't support newer features, then the stream of register values just doesn't play back. You end up with gaps and skips. 
And the, some VGM players will actually say, sorry, that's the wrong kind of playback device. Okay, have you have you fiddled with Todd's player? Like, is he translating between the chips then? Or is it you have to play a VGM on a V, or not VGM, but a, 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 a YM2149 on a YM2149? The, the previous one, I haven't seen this new one yet, but the previous one basically showed you the menu of items based on the chip you were aiming for. Okay. Because you can just look that up right out of the uh, file. Okay. I guess I'll have to get some more details from them because my, my understanding was that this would translate between them. So, Todd, if you're watching this, uh, give me a shout out on Discord or by the email, et cetera, here and uh, let me get some details. Maybe get you on to talk about it a little bit too. I know he's translating the clock speeds. I don't know if he's translating the, the register dumps to different formats. Okay. I just know it sounds damn impressive. No, it does. <laughs> Beauty, eh? Yeah. Well, it's a one for one playback because uh, the way these are captured is by mm -hmm. watching the stream of data go to the sound chip and then recording that and then just playing it back. So when you th there are tools that you can get that will take these VGM files and they will actually dump them out as a series of events in text format. So you can actually see what's going on. And it's basically dump this register value, wait this long, dump this register value, wait this long. A very cool little setup for uh getting as as accurate a sound as you probably can <laughs> all right so what you said earlier it kind of sounds like okay here's your target this is what you're going to get and you can decide if that's enough for you and if you have that particular right. hardware like in this case he's got all three sound cards so you can you know right so in this, switch like, wheeling in this case here because he supports the gmc that's the lowest common denominator of only having like three channels and none you can't change the waveforms and stuff so if you had like a 12 voice track it's not going to play all 12 voices so i'd imagine the register dump would might hit the first three channels and the ignore subsequent the rest channels just get ignored or something so yeah i think it's more details from todd there yeah but it's interesting it sounds it sounds beautiful yeah and of course he's using his uh ibm cj font oh that is also beautiful Okay, next up that we got a bit of an update from Roger Taylor on <clears throat> you know going into the insides of the gimme here. And you can see the two gimmies on the uh, 86 and 87. And uh, the measurements here are millimeters. Each wow. one of these little dashes you can see how small these chips are. But you can also see the gimme 86 on the left here actually has more transistors than the gimme 87 on the right. Now I do know the 87 fixed some bugs, there were some timing issues, there was some speculation that they tried to shorten the paths of some of the wiring because they were having latency problems on doing stuff that's very speed intensive like hardware scrolling horizontally because you're having to deal with a 15.75 kilohertz signal and then shifting it on the fly while you're going type thing but it also could mean maybe there's some extra bits on the 86 gimme that are not on the 87 or it could be all due to bug fixes we're not sure but uh, it's definitely interesting and the fact you can see the die itself is actually bigger on the 86 uh, six on right. the left there too yeah. And has big long buses instead of two rows of shorter buses. Is that significant? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you can see the <clears throat> you shrunk down a bit more. You can see the ruler scale of a millimeter. But millimeter for those who aren't in metric, a millimeter is the uh, thickness of a dime, roughly. It shows you how small these actually are, and then these are huge by today's standards. <laughs> wow! Absolutely. So Really looking forward to what else uh, Roger Taylor finds on this As project that he's on. Peel on back one. the layers of the gimme, like sands through the hourglass. These are yep. the layers go, of go, the gimme. Go support his Patreon if you haven't already, if you're interested in this kind of stuff here, because this is not cheap stuff to do. So, Give me some more. Next up here, Jamie Cho. <clears throat> Actually, this was pretty cool. Jerry Ellsworth, of course, is a rather famous hacker. I, what, what did you call her? Um, she's an actress as well. Um, but she's she's well known in the hacking community, and she's done tons of stuff with game systems and other computers, etc. And she actually posted on Twitter here about a Coco Two that she helped restore, and she talks a little bit about the history of it. So Jamie chose one who posted the link to it, so I wanted to give him a shout out. And then here's Jerry's actual post: restored a Tier City Coco Model Two was in pretty bad shape with multiple cable burns and yellowing. Interesting fact is that this computer ran at 880 kilohertz. That's a little bit off, but pretty close. It's 895. 
which was the same frequency as our hometown AM radio station, KWIP. Fond memories of playing games with my friend Mike on it. So that's, she actually had encountered the Coco back in the day too, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so one of the more famous people in, in the modern hacker community to actually have touched the Coco back in the day too. So Cool stuff. I wonder if she ever played that game Dagrath, like that idiot from the book. <laughs> what that? Yeah, Jerry is a very scary developer um, who built a chip fab in her own bedroom at one point to recreate the Commodore 64. So we're talking some serious skills. Extremely, extremely detailed hardware stuff. Was also involved with Valve for a while and had a very interesting project for augmented reality stuff going on. Just lots of interesting news out of that corner. Yeah. Uh, next up, we've got Mikey. Mikey. Maybe he'll wake up now. We're mentioning, hey, Mikey, wake up. We're talking about you. Yeah. So he's <laughs> actually put up a couple of videos this week. Um, thanks, Kat. Um, so the first one here, running an Edgestein ease of use to use on Xor's ID controller. So one difference between the Xor emulator and other ones like MAME, VCC, and OVCC is that it uh, when it emulates a hard drive, it doesn't have the MU disk, like just the little software. And he's actually emulating basically the equivalent of the Glenside ID controller. And ease of use we be designed for the Coco SDC or for the emulator specifically. And I'm, one thing Bill and I do not want to do is make a bazillion different versions of Nitrous 9 because then we're back to the repository level where you know new users are not even going to have a clue what to pick to download to run on whatever system they have, which is why we did a base common denominator. Now, we have no problem with other people actually you know making compendiums of these things for different pieces of hardware and of course the experienced users will just insert their own drivers for whatever they want but we wanted a base uh, simple thing that people could just install it and they would know it comfortably that it would run so what he does here is he has a video here <clears throat> 25 minutes about using the xwares id controller how to replace certain modules to get it to work uh with the emulated id and now what you can boot ease of use after you go through all this on xwar on the coco 3. so that was his first video and then uh he also put up here a JSON uh, explaining exactly how to do it. And you can actually edit this yourself. So you wanted to replace it for SCSI or MFM RLL controllers like the Burke and Burke here. This little script will actually take and redo the boot hard drive image and uh, the floppy you know, bootstrap for it so that it will boot up with those drivers installed. So you can run ease of use on, on various mixed hardware platforms beyond what we do on our base core one. So once this is kind of ironed out a little bit, and a few people mentioned they were probably going to make, I think Ron Klein mentioned it, they're going to make available some more common boots. And we'll actually have a link off the main ease of use site to where if you want to go a little bit outside the norm and get certain combinations, because I, I can't put every single combination. Like somebody had mentioned on uh, one of the uh, Discord channels that they would like to have drive wire, you know, full drive wire support. Well, what is that? You can have drive wire for the bit banger. You can have drive wire for the RS52 pack. You can have drive wire for the R, uh, modem pack. You can have drive wire for 6552. You can have drive wire for 16550. Next thing you know, you're cards. going over an eight slot MPI. <laughs> yeah, and then that's just the hardware support for drive wire. Now you got you want the real time clock. Do you want the virtual terminals? Do you want MIDI support? Do you want virtual printer support? Blah 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 blah. There's a ton of stuff here, and that's the reason we didn't put all that stuff in there as defaults. We picked a couple of very small core ones that are the most common. But obviously, Nitrous 9 supports all this stuff if you have the right drivers. So if, one, if you're experienced Nitrous 9 person or OS 9 person, you just would do this yourself. But these people like uh, Ron and, and Mikey are you know, kind of making these alternate ones that we'll link to off the site. They won't be included with the distribution, but if you want to grab one of those because you do have some special case needs that you want to do yourself, they will be available with it. You have to build them all yourself at some point. Um, I will act, admit right now, support-wise, Bill and I won't support those directly. We'll refer you to Ron and, and Michael and anybody else who does them. So they can take all the tech support. Okay, on. and Mikey's also saying that binary packages with hard drive images are available. You don't have to run the script yourself. So I guess he's going to package this up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, right. I mean, I, we're all for it. just that Bill and I don't want to have to concentrate on all these other bits and pieces because we'd be doing so much support stuff we wouldn't be getting any part of the app right right and yeah. then you have to you have to test it on all the different platforms too so keep your keep your development test environment consistent and so yeah. there's there's fewer it, it's uh, kind of like what bill's doing with Mat matchbox like the matchbox coco it's because he we do the original release for the 609 609 first which we try to test as much as we can everything that's been changed and then usually a few weeks later bill does an update for the matchbox with the extra you know 80 by 50 
tech support and all that kind of stuff on it too. And he does the same type of thing specifically for that bit of hardware. And then, you know, anybody else who wants to add all these other things can, you know, go to town. Okay. Next up, uh, Tony Jewell and the Dragon Group. Uh, this was something that was shown at the Dragon Meetup, and there's some videos about that coming up a little bit later in the show here. But this was the uh, CP400 Coco clone from Brazil that somebody brought to the Dragon Meetup at Cambridge. So he was kind of going through <clears throat> making a circuit here. I, I did not know this. Um, apparently, there's more than one version of PAL. So, of course, the UK is all PAL-based. Brazil is also PAL-based, but Brazil uses what's called PAL-M. And maybe someone in the chat can explain exactly what the difference is to that. I'm not exactly sure. Um, apparently, it's not just 60 hertz PAL either. It's it's something different than that again. So it's like I, there's multiple versions of PAL. But he showed this running here, and you can actually see the, some pretty decent pictures of it here with the uh, little happy face uh, converter circuit he did. And obviously got it running with the 50 hertz PAL system in, in, in uh, the UK. So I don't know if anybody in the chat there can explain exactly what the difference between the different versions of PAL is. I, I didn't even know there was all that many different versions of PAL. But some really good pictures of the- uh, I'm the sure it has to do something with regional because I know there's like, there's different even versions of NTSC too, like a Japanese one and, um, you know, uh, in American and stuff. So um, might be regional. Yeah, it could be. Because is it, uh, South America is on the same electrical grid as us. So I'm assuming they have 60 Hertz, right? Then you have places like Japan, they have both. Right. right. So that could be interesting. That might be it. 50 hertz PAL and 60 hertz PAL. Yeah, I guess. And then, then PAL M, I'm not sure what, what that is. And plus, I mean, we also get into stuff like NTSC. Does it have the artifact colors? Or maybe there's certain versions of NTSC that don't. I don't, I don't have a clue. It's getting beyond my pay grade. But... Okay, so 60, 60 is saying the NTSC timing and color subcarrier, but with phase alternating line so you don't need a daft hue control <laughs> i thought japan used ntsc j j right yes in that case the j would be for japan um but yeah i don't know what the m stands for maybe it's macho it's the l macho be. ntsc manly i don't know. manly yes hmm <laughs> good question somebody google that shit all right ask siri uh, next up, so Alan Huffman did a follow-up video. So uh, on the previous episode, he went into a video explaining a nice, easy, quick, easy way in basic to calculate if you want to set bits or clear bits on a byte using two to the power of the bit number, base zero. And uh, it works. And if you just need to you know, do a quick translation, I need to figure out what specific settings on the VDG chip. For example, I want the color border turned on with inverse video and no lowercase or whatever. But it's quite slow. So if you're doing something often in a game or in a program where you're going to be switching bits on certain bits of hardware uh, fairly often, it's very slow. Doing two to the power or any power thing in, in Microsoft Basic is extremely slow. So he, he did a quick video showing you an alternative way where you basically pre-build the bit patterns into an array. And then it's much faster, like orders of magnitude faster than doing the uh, two to the power one. Takes a bit more memory because you have to build the array up and that's kind of like unrolling a loop or a compiled sprite concept at this point in here, right? It's just putting everything. Yeah, but the, the speed gain, if you need the speed, is definitely worth it. It's it's a huge increase in speed. So he kind of goes through it all there in his typically uh, exuberant way. I, I love his videos actually because they're very friendly and he's he's kind of talking off the cuff here. He, he I don't know if he has a script per se, but it's a straight one take thing. And sometimes you'll watch him code something a little bit wrong or whatever. Like it's all live type thing. It's kind of like, you know, we'll it's, it it's not as much of a train wreck as us. And he's doing, it, he's doing it on the Cocoa Pie. Yeah, he's you can even see his the, uh, the face reflecting the screen on occasion when he's recording yeah. it too. So That was cool. Next up, I think I remember John Linville is the one who posted about this in the Coco group on Facebook first, create but it's a, a vintage computing that creates Christmas a challenge. Tree as seen in the image above. One one to one, exactly the same shape. No additional characters. Tree has to be centered, if it's possible. Uh, we don't mind colors. Program can finish afterwards. Return to prompt. Use any machine you like, preferably vintage. Use any language you like. If you do use basic, do not include assembler code. Peek and pokes are allowed. Even sys is allowed. All right, so they're basically saying, here's a tree. This is like that 1K program code. Now yeah, make, make, make a tree. 
Okay. So now they do have a secondary one too. Uh, challenge variation two. Be wild and creative and do something totally or different or similar. And it should be just about Christmas, obviously. No count restrictions, no strict rules. So obviously a few people have, have kind of latched onto this. Uh, Jim Gary's one, and I'll show some of his stuff Hold here. Hold beer. A second. And then we got some comments on the Jim Gary's video where you know some other people did some various versions of it as well. Um, I think Paul Shoemaker might have been one of them. Now, originally, when when Jim Gary first released this, he actually had the source code. But the, one of the rules is don't publish the source code until the contest is over. Mm. So he quickly redid the video, but some people might have caught it. So now it's very short, but basically, there you go. Okay. So that's Jim Gary's little entry there. There's and the it's tree. got some auto centering and blah blah blah. So for the version two of the contest, Jim decided to spice it up with a bit of color and stuff here. And he actually had released multiple videos showing different things, like he changed the graphics mode a little bit, um, where he changes it to graphics but leaves it in the text mapping. So it's kind of strange looking. Others you just use semi-graphics colors. And then he just this morning released a video that kind of combined all four of his new versions into one video. So that's one I'll play here in its entirety. Lord have mercy. Ooh, look at that. Ooh. The psychedelic tree. Ooh. At this point. Wow, this looks like freaking QR codes on acid. Um, <laughs> this is one of them <laughs> aluminum trees from the sun. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, now that is cool. That is cool. Because it's green, man. It's like totally Two green. different shades of green. Dude, it's like so green, man. It's like, wow. I don't know, there's two a shades of green. <laughs> How many shades would you use? Right. This, this saved me money. Like I don't rotating. have to buy a tree now. So. Yeah, it's like rotating. Can't, yeah, the cat can't knock the inch, uh, ornaments off that tree. Yeah. Well, they could knock the monitor off the stand, I guess. Yeah, but the yeah, ornaments nice. would still that be on there. That is so cool, man. So at any rate, um, this is Jim's post originally in the MC10 group on Facebook. Um, mentions the contest, kind of goes through it a bit. Then Paul Shoemaker did one here too. Uh oh, hold my beer. And he said Jim's that. was much more clever than mine. Uh, so. List. You're not supposed to list it. Yeah. Not he crammed ahead. it into like a you know a lot less space. But. Okay. Wow. So that's all kind of formulaically done there at this point, huh? Yeah, you know, the centering and, and you know, kind of compressing the code a bit too. Uh, and then there's Jim YouTube Gary when he started doing these other ones. Okay, won't you take me? And Anders did one here too. Um, funky tree. And we got an MC10 emulator. And boom. Oh, oh my God, are we doing an upside down? Are we rotating? Oh, yeah, we are. Rotating. We are rotating. Oh my God, this is. Ooh. This is as a gate crasher in the MC10 at Christmas. Oh yeah! At oh point. yeah! Now it's like completely sideways. Okay, yeah, we're like doing a 360 degree rotation. Yeah, the tree is in the same place. You're doing a barrel roll. <laughs> okay. So wow. it's, it's interesting to see that there's been so much MC10 stuff. I haven't seen too many yeah. Cocoa specific ones yet. Alan mentions he's got it down to 66 or 67 bytes of basic to do. It's wow. Hold my beer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next step, uh, John Whitworth. And this is a dragon related story here. So um, we've mentioned before in the show a couple months ago, he had made a round of about 20 of the power supply unit boards because that's one of the things that actually does tend to blow on the, uh, the dragon, steel dragons. And he had such demand because he said, I'm doing this one run. They're a pain in the ass to make. I don't want to make any more. But he had so many requests for it. He said, well, okay, what I'll do is I'll make a kit form of it. Okay. So I'll give you all the parts and pieces and the PCBs and you will have to do all the little yeah. soldering of the bits. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, right? <laughs> yeah. So basically, he's uh, got 20 kits up. He put up for sale on the 13th of December, so five days ago. He's already sold over half them, from what I've understood. <clears throat> and uh, you can actually order them on his site here. And he's got a little picture of it here, too, and the cost of the kit version. 
This is not something he wants to do too often. Now, we talked to Frank at Retro Rewind last week and said, you know, is this something you'd be interested in doing? Because he sells a lot of stuff to the European market mm -hmm. for the Amiga stuff and Commodore stuff he does. And he said, one of the problems with doing power supply stuff is you have to get this certified by governments uh, to be safe. Like, you have to apply for it. And he says it's about a $5,000 per country license wow. to get this. So wow. that's why you would not normally manufacture this unless you're, that's like a mainstay of your business. Now, there is a bit of a loop around here, and you'll actually see it mentioned here on, on John's site, too. Please read the safety see? notice regarding homebrew power board before completing purchase. Yeah, so I guess you can get around it if you make it a kit with a bunch of warnings that people can get harmed, <laughs> basically, yes. is my understanding. Mm -hmm. And Frank had mentioned he'll look into that to see if it's worth the legal, possible legal hassle. Um, because there obviously is demand for it. I mean, he sold out 20 a couple of months ago and you made another 20 and he's already got down to like seven left as of yesterday. So he's already sold 33 of these in a very quick span. So there's well, obviously it's, demand. Since it's using an off the shelf DC power brick, mm -hmm. uh, I think that would get around the, that, the, the power brick would have. Power brick is already issue. like UL rated and everything. Yeah. And then yeah, that's I think it had just the... a low voltage project. I think I think what the regulations had to do with was actually hooking to the mains, the power mains. Yeah, the yeah. DC so I think would do that exactly. Okay. But I'm I'm not I'm not an attorney or yeah. and don't play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, and I don't even know hardware, so this is all way above my pay grade. So. Okay. Yeah, well, just keep okay. soldering your hair, Curtis. It'll be fine. No, I quit <laughs> doing that. I like my hair. All right. Cool project. So anyway, if you have a dragon and you live in the UK. There are a few of these boards left as of yesterday. I think there's still some now because he usually takes it off the site if it's totally sold out. But he's he's running out quick again. So okay. And he said if he does do another run of these because the part shortage of getting chips and stuff is is pretty bad. If he does do another run, he probably won't be able to do it for a few months. If that's if he decides to do it again. Next, we got a follow up. Richard Harding's posted his second video with commentary this time of what his walk around at the Dragon Meetup. Um, I know when we had our meet, uh, walk around that he was doing with us, that was already when the crowds were pretty heavy, so we were getting a lot of you know background noise. This is a bit easier to hear everything. So if you want to kind of have a recap, I won't play it here because obviously we, we did it on our show before, but if you want a, a recap that's a bit easier to hear, and he actually talks to some of the developers that we missed because nice. they weren't around at the time. Nice. You can go through that and uh, a lot of cool stuff in there, including a few things we were kind of guessing at originally. <laughs> Next, this is a channel I'd not heard of before called Retro Marky, and he got a, a Dragon 32 system from a family member. So he did uh, two videos. The first one's kind of an unboxing, kind of going through you know what he what he got in the in the kit here. Um, he actually got a fair number of games with it Ooh, here. Nice. That came with it. Um, All that beautiful cassette artwork there. Yep, yep, pretty good stuff. Now, unfortunately, when he gets to the second one. <clears throat> The second video is follow-up video because this was basically more the unboxing and kind of going through what came in it but the second video he did he actually found some problems um and he actually hasn't got it running yet and it's related to the power supply yeah so i actually i sent him a link to john whitworth's posting that uh if, if it's related to that then okay. maybe we can get it going because he said at this point he didn't really know where to go with this at this point right i hope he gets it up and running because it looks like he's got some pretty cool games and some rare yeah. ones that i haven't seen before so i'd love to see some videos on that And then our final regular news story, which is actually a late add-on by Terry Steggy. Do you want to kind of preamble this one, Terry? Uh, nobody cares. Move on. Yeah, no. <laughs> Bless your heart. Bless your heart, Terry. Don't have, don't hold back, Stevie. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. <laughs> oh, I actually had a request from one of my subscribers to connect a GoTech to the Coco. Was, was, that, was, that, your, was that your uncle or your aunt? Because you only have two subscribers, you loser. <laughs> Depends on the ones I fire. <laughs> okay, I they're know, all Stevie, bots. He's got 785 views oh, on this oh, already, and that's good, that's good for that's, you. That's more than our show gets by quite a large margin. And so. it even made it to YouTube CA, eh? Yeah, so it made it all all the way to Canada. Hey, you're a celebrity, bro. <laughs> Take off, hoser. <laughs> Take off. Yeah, cool. I actually don't know too much about these. I know the people who have them say they that we're spoiled by the Coco SDC because it's much easier to navigate. You know, on a full screen, and these you have to kind of navigate on that little LED screen, right? LCD, whatever. Yeah, the the new version's actually quite a bit easier. It just has that uh, knob on the right side there. You can just scroll through pretty quick. I, I love my SDC, but these are actually kind of handy for uh, um, 
you know, just doing a quick one off on something, you just throw a jump drive in and or a USB drive in and you're move it over. It, it works pretty good. But plus these are cross platform. You can use a GoTech on a lot of retro systems. Exactly. Yeah. I've got another video I had done for the uh, MS DOS version, which just had a couple other config changes. But yeah, I've been blown away. This this video's pushing like almost eight hundred views yeah, with nice it hasn't been a day yet. So good, good job, dude. Seriously. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's been kind of fun. Actually, yeah. I've enjoyed doing this. Do you yeah. um do you have to like uh, flash the firmwares and the GoTeks to work on different systems? No, that's the nice thing. Um, there's jumpers on the back. Okay. Or the the more important stuff is a FF config file that you just load on the root of that USB drive. Oh, interesting. And, and so you can just change it. Oh, to, look at that! Uh, look at you with your aunt fancy intro video there. Look at you. <laughs> That's why it gets the big views, Stevie. Yeah, look yeah. at that. Oh, my. Oh, dude, what's going on here? I'm like entering the Matrix or something. The production Steve, values Steve. of this one are strong. Yeah. yeah, Stevie, you need to hire this guy. Wow, this is amazing. Oh, Stevie couldn't afford me. Let me yeah, check. Right, I hear you. <laughs> oh, my God. Now this is a show where we don't know the meaning of production value. <laughs> wow. Welcome to Retro. Look at that. Wow. Yeah, professional photography and everything yeah. else instead of Man. us winging it. You know? wow. That's why he's getting those 800 views and we can only get 100. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, guys, if we didn't keep having brawls during our production meetings, we might get something done. Yeah. I still fight with myself. You know, it's it's bad. But... Ah. There's a production meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was a rehearsal. Eric C., is that Eric Canales? <laughs> it is, yep. Okay. Yeah, I think Eric uses a GoTech fairly regularly, and so does Henry Wright. Films. And, and, and I'm sure that. David Ladd has got some fondness for this too. Mm. Yeah. So, so the GoTech is basically it's a floppy emulator, right? So it talks to it. It looks and acts like a floppy drive to the actual computer system, but then it it acts as kind of the middleware device where then instead of it being a physical floppy, it can just pull a disk image from a storage device. Exactly. Right. Um, and I know in the past that people have had to work fairly hard to get these things to work properly and make them somewhat user friendly and stuff. And so, um, are they? Is there? Are they, has this just evolved now, where it's a little bit more plug and play and cross platform friendly and stuff? Or, you know, the biggest um, barrier to entry, I would say, for the Tandy side was nobody wants to cut up their disk drive cables to make this work so oh, this one because our, our wiring found, is our wiring is not standard exactly it's an actual like a standard floppy drive it's the what is it idc ide pins whereas you know this has um, this adapter that you're seeing on the screen by uh, blue lava it actually just converts it to um, an edge card so you don't you don't have to modify anything on your existing hardware which i liked and the additionally on the new version there's actually a speaker in that so <laughs> when you access the quote unquote drive it actually sounds like a floppy drive uh okay like mame program. does yeah exactly yep so does it also emulate the speed where it loads in at the right speed of a floppy it does you can actually change that um uh, this particular one i had to change it to be the what is it shugart um specs and uh yeah it, it's no different than having a floppy on your machine interesting now you're down i didn't want to modify my coco you can hardwire this Ooh. in but i want to use this on multiple cocos so i just bought a uh, power supply external power supply for it and i can move it then but in this process i found my uh, uh my vader coco something's goofy with the I'm assuming the cartridge slot. I could not plug the FD501 in and make it work to save my life. Works with the SDC, but will not work with the, any, even my, um, I have a, what is it, Alware and a, what's the other one, the J and, gosh, J&M. J&M, thank you. I um, have one. I cannot get those to work on that Vader machine. So, anyway. That's kind of what this video is. This came like about. a multi personality cable where you've got different heads that are pinned out differently, or is this just one that got dual floppy? It's a dual floppy one. I just kind of banded it up because when I was trying to film it, the damn thing was flopping all over the place. Yeah. And yeah. 
And uh, okay, but you have to make sure you put it on the the very first adapter, just like any other you know drive zero has to be on the first one. Okay, so now I'm just using an external power supply to power it, and I've got like yep. the, the mini Molex, the full size Molex adapter there. Yep. Uh, and you can hook up a real drive at the same time if you want to transfer files off real drives to the to the GoTech, correct? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, it's so no different. So you would just select a disk image, mount that, and then you would just copy a zero to one or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's all I've had to do. It it works phenomenally. I am actually working on three D printing a case for this particular machine. Oh. So, I can so it'll look like it a, a Coco bit. drive or something. Exactly. Yeah, that's oh. the, a little smaller, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> I just finished one Ooh. for my. I know. I know a certain someone who would love a gift like this—a GoTech in a 3D printed floppy enclosure. Ooh. I'm kind of glad he's not on today. I was. Gonna <laughs> off, you know, so. David Lavin has everything. <laughs> he does have everything. <laughs> oh man, this is cool, Terry. Your 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 definitely your camera angle and how you got things going and everything is really nice, sir. Well, thank you. It actually looks like he knows what he's doing. We should take yeah, lessons. Yeah, 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 really. What are you doing on this show? Uh, <laughs> Jeez. Bless your heart. Bless your heart there. Actually, there's your GitHub for getting the flash floppy. I've been trying to use my Tandy Shack um, as a repository for a lot of things that are hard to find. But this particular episode, everything was pretty readily, readily available. I did uh, decide I wanted to put Nick's a gate crasher um in this episode so i actually finish out the episode downloading that putting nice. it on the usb and and playing that so very cool so you tied it into the game of the week made it all current and relevant and... and of course my favorite i had to put shock trooper on so do, 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 being a v fan you know <laughs> do, 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 do. there you go shock do 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 Was this a capture from your Coco, or is this? Uh, yeah, I, it's actually. Um, is it R I'm, RGB to HDMI? Yep. Yeah, super that's, that's super nice clean. Or, yeah, I've, that's been a pain. Can, could I, you I, um, I, could you go into eighty columns and make sure it's not blurry? You know, it's just there's no pleasing you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, crasher, load crasher. I did speed this part up just for time's sake, so the flames go a little nuts. Ooh, to me. Look at that! Oh. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> Level one. Now, did you submit a score this week? I don't remember. I did. I did not do the um, the hack. I actually let the timer run, but I got like eight hundred and sixty or something like that. So I was happy. Not not on this particular gameplay. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he got one spot above me. Beauty, eh? Oh, Lord. Now you're doing the outro Now he's even got too? outros. Look at this. <laughs> wow. Thanks for watching. I have, I have to agree with Robert Allen Murphy, who you know, was commenting on why is he on the show, and he said technically it's called slumming. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, Whatever. <laughs> retro Tech Time. Look at you, Mr. Fancy That's Pants. That's the end of the there. news. That's Mr. <laughs> fancy Pants there. How are you doing there, Fancy Pants, with your fancy videos and camera angles and intros and outros and factually Actual correct knowledge and factually correct information that goes with your content. <laughs> content. Trying to make us all look bad here, aren't you? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> well done, bud. Well, Rock thanks, on. Man. Rock on, brother. Hallelujah. And bless your heart. <laughs> you lovely little. Uh, oh, I forgot. Handsome. You're handsome. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I think you paid that person. <laughs> I had no idea where that came from. <laughs> Someone with a twisted sense of humor, right? So, well, it's uh, on with us then. <laughs> right. Um. Cool. 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 So now this comes to. Another part, another, and this is not, this, this segment, probably not as popular as a game on segment, but this is where we get into updates and acquisitions. Have you received anything in the mail? Did you get something new on eBay? Are you working on a project? Uh, you know, you got something you want to share, story to tell, anything like that. So I believe Rick Euland, 
you had mentioned you wanted to announce something. I don't remember what it was, but I think you did say you had something to share, right? Indeed, I do. Um, let me try to click this button and achieve share screenage, which I think just means I blindly click on stuff until someone says, yeah, I see a window now. I see it. Okay, Beauty, so eh? this is like the, uh, oh, yeah, I even got a little pop-up that says it worked. Yeah. Um, so this may be the first uh, web page on the internet designed for the Coco to read directly. And uh, it's not a beauty queen right now, but it is a beauty, eh? It, it is online. And, How do you, uh, if you're you reading know, this page? Uh, and then I may quickly click away so you can't keep up a train of thought. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's got pop-ups for links, so you can use it with the keyboard and stuff like that. This is the web browser that I wrote for to go with the Coco I.O. card. Okay. And so, of course, um, Mark is letting me sleep on his couch virtually. So here is a web page on his, uh, what is it, uh, playclassics.net site. Um, okay. If you ha happen to have this product and you've already downloaded this stuff, change these two lines in your basic and you will go to the new page. If you haven't, I will have Get Hope changed in a minute. So there's so, an actual hosted Cocoa website right now on the interwebs that somebody can get to with an actual Cocoa. Exactly. You could go to playclassics.net slash Cocoa.io dot slash index and see it on a regular web browser. And if you shrink it really, 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 really small, it will look kind of like the Cocoa page does. <laughs> right. But what's the um, fun we, in that? We want to see it on a Cocoa. <laughs> right, right. You see it on a Cocoa. Well, and then I'm also going to have some non-Cocoa sort of okay, here's where you go to the GitHub and download the program kind of thing. So you can go there with any browser and just kind of uh, get your Cocoa IO on. So, and we'll be doing one for the Cocoa Nick project as soon as it has stuff to put online. So, uh, yeah, Cocoa browsers. Oh. I like then, the fact uh, you're doing it in Basic 9. And have you tried it on my site? Because I purposely made that fairly dumbed down so it would work with a Cocoa browser, which was my original intent 20 years ago. When I tried, I didn't have much luck, um, but that was a more early version of dub, dub, dub. Okay. Yeah, okay. so we may be better now. And then a sad note, here's the top 30 foot of my maple tree oh. laying in the backyard from the windstorm that we, oh. that we got a while back. So, Can you wring it out and get maple syrup from it? I don't know, but it looks pretty funny now without the peak on top. Yeah. yeah. So, so sorry about know. that tree. Any there pictures of your hot neighbor across the street while we're on this? Or no, no <laughs> I, think the, I think the exploding tree scared her off. She's, she's and hit. Simmer down, Stevie. Yeah, simmer oh. down. <laughs> and, uh, Beauty, eh? So we so, have a, we have a cocoa. What the hell does immersive mean? I don't oh there's a new view and so there's a discord there's a zoom update and there's a new view that's called immersive i have no idea what that is and i'm scared to try it right now so we'll, we'll leave that alone <laughs> so um, why does zoom only give you the update thing just before you go into a meeting oh who knows who knows at any other time you can't update it for hell i go to all yeah. the settings there's the, the update's not there blah 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 okay it just popped up here so now i can update in the middle of the show Right, right, right. <laughs> no, gonna kick you off. Uh, Grant Leedy, did you have something you wanted to mention? Yes, I got some Cocoa uh, Fest information here that we have finally have decided on the pricing and uh, emissions and table fees and everything like that. So, and I am proud to announce that Cocoa Fest will be free to attend this year. Woohoo! So you will, or next year. You, yeah, next year. I'm sorry for 2022. So. Yes. Uh, the only, the only caveat is if you still want to be a member of the Glenside Color Computer Club, you will still need to pay your $15 dues. But if you get a table, then that your will dues, that then will cover your dues cover automatically. It. Okay. So, Beautiful. So if you get a table, that will do. That for your will dues. do. For your dues. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So Coco Fest is free this year. This is the first time in, in probably Ever, history. I think. It is free, and hopefully we can continue that tradition because um, that would just be cool, right? And for any of us here that are involved with other retro groups like general or retro communities that cover a variety of machines, plug it as much as you can, especially for people that are in that area. Yes. The fact that it's free, if they've been kind of nervous to want to spend 15 bucks, I'm not that much into the Cocoa yet. Right. Um, encourage them to go because now it won't cost them anything to get in. 
Right, right, and I and I and we have this information up in our stream too, right? So we have the dates on our Cocoa Talk stream, where Cocoa Fest twenty two is happening May fourteenth and fifteenth, and you can go to glensideccc.com to find out about that. And if you want to register, that should take you over to tandylist.com, where you can register, pre-register, you can reserve. I don't know if they have the floor plan laid out for this next year already or not. Do you know, Grant? Can we already? Not yet. Uh, okay. We're looking at January fifteenth. That hopefully will go live. So okay. So, um, beauty, eh? Free. Yep. Cocoa Fest is free. That's the big news. And then the dinner was still between ours as it was from last year. And that year. dinner was awesome. Definitely so. Yeah. One other thing, too. I, 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 I would like to request we do not have meatloaf at this. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed the meatloaf. Did you really? So, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess is it crass as me, and I, maybe, but uh, I enjoyed the meatloaf. Yeah. Okay, Steve, we'll I get just... this. We'll get the salmon for you next year. There we go, salmon. As I recall, it was it was democratic. People voted for it. They, they wanted. did, and that, that blows <laughs> my mind. That just well, I just picked mind. meatloaf and then ate all the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the other thing too is I am starting to look for speakers. So if you are interested in uh, giving a presentation for Coco Fest uh, next year, just uh, reach out to me on Discord or send me an email at Coco Fest at glensidecc. Let's get that Terry Steg in there. He can he can tell us all how to make good YouTube videos. So people can watch <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good one. Oh, God, no. Beauty, eh? Beauty. Yeah, Ben I'd... and I've already volunteered. We'll do one together again. Oh, I think crap. I will definitely be hitting Terry up for a uh, commercial for yeah <laughs> for the uh, Coco oh, yeah. Fest. Oh yeah, yeah. No, honestly, Terry, your video production skills are on a level so far beyond the grasp of mere mortals that um, it is uh, it's phenomenal. I cannot afford this episode. You're, the bill you're going to send me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being serious, man. I'm totally being oh, serious. Thank I, you. Uh, and I, I do, uh, I have good and bad news. I'm not going to be able to go to Coco Fest this year, but it's for a good reason. My uh, third granddaughter is going to be born cesarean that actual weekend. Really? So well, it's already if, scheduled. Listen, so. if, if she knows, if, if they're going to do it that way, they can move the date around. Come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Listen. I'm, I'm already in hot water. My daughter's name is Courtney, and I've always called her Coco. She just figured out this last <laughs> year why her nickname's Coco. So I, I have to be good. <laughs> oh, that's like one year. Or somebody was saying, "Oh yeah, my sister's getting married." But look, like, listen, you know when Coco Fest is a year out. Tell your sister to move the freaking wedding already. You know, it's like, come on. Yeah, I told my son-in-law, I'm like, you know, we got to talk, man. This is, this <laughs> this is, is your Coco. fault. This is Coco Fest, man. Priorities, man. That's you right. did this <laughs> and i'll be paying for this episode hopefully she's not gonna watch oh so. lord <laughs> don't worry no one watches this nobody why i'm good okay. <laughs> yeah just look yeah. at your numbers versus ours yeah, terry more, more, people, whatever. Whatever. more people watch <laughs> retro tech time apparently than coco apparently Talk, yes. So, yes oh god lord oh. have mercy so, well grant uh, you were looking for speakers I, I got one right here. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks, yeah. Jason. <laughs> it's, got a, it's got a button and a volume control and everything. That yeah. looks pretty 90s. I don't know. It is. If it is, it is if you're, definitely. If you're definitely. looking for some feedback, uh, here you go. No, oh, okay. there it is. Feedback for you there, too. So. <laughs> Actually, we, we, if we can get that speaker for Stevie with the volume control, I'd like that, too. So. <laughs> How much, just, or the mute button would be good, too. Uh, oh, Lord. That's extra. <laughs> Coco Fest number 30, the 30th annual Coco Fest. Isn't that something? That is something. That's that, an addition to all the Rainbow Fest that happened. Right, and that, and that is because we they actually skipped a year because the 29th annual happened a year later than it should have happened. So this should have been the 31st Coco Fest, theoretically. But, you know, thank you, COVID. All right, so... Uh, uh, Rick, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited about having a, a browser that you can browse on a Coco. And I like that you have a product that you're working on that actually has an application ready to use on it, too. So when people grab this Coco, what is it called now? Coco Net or Coco IO? What's the? Uh, there was already a Coco Net, so I'm Coco IO. Coco IO. <laughs> so when people get the Coco IO network card for their Cocos, they can pop it into a browser and just browse their little happy hearts out, right? And uh, I, I thought I was making a hardware product, and I'm writing content and setting up servers, and <laughs> I was so far wrong. How but deep it's fun. does rabbit hole go? Right. Exactly so. So yeah, if anyone wants to write any Coco content, we're putting uh, on the site, we're actually putting pages that work with the browser so far, so you can write to the thing. And then as kind of uh, test it yeah. out, yeah. 
And as soon as the other uh, products come online, we will also write pages towards them. So we'll we'll see what we can do to make this thing go. That's far out. With any, with any luck, we'll make some extractions so that uh, there'll be a network layer for the individual network interface, and then the browser could sit on top of that. So anyway. Hey, Rick, I got a question. Is, is there a possibility that you could give us the specs of what these – I guess our HTML pages or whatever they are look like, and we could convert our, our current websites to possibly be compatible with your um, browser. That's, that's actually the purpose of the site that's online now. So I'm keeping the, there, there are like tutorial pages on how to write a Cocoa website that I will keep updated as new features come online yeah. with the, the product. So nice. You can go there and, and say, oh, I get to do tables this week. And this is HTML5 <laughs> with CSS and all that good stuff? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> JavaScript, you name it, it's all there. It, <laughs> I asked for 1.0. Most people give me 1.1. It works. Uh-huh. You know, but, but we're talking static HTML, no JavaScript, obviously. Yeah, no. That's like um, going back but, to the roots, uh, man. The roots of the but are you supporting bl- the annoying blinking text? Oh yeah, we got that. Oh, right. guys got blinks, so I, yeah. can, now, I missed there, that. Now, is there throw a, that in for fifty bytes? You know? <laughs> is, is, we will we be able to put an under construction uh, banner on there? In a, in oh, a, we need a, the guy with the yeah, yeah throw on the shoulder. <laughs> yes. Actually, Rick, there's one of those included, I believe, in uh, EOU and in, in the GIFs directory. So you program, oh, we'll sweet, do that for sweet. you. And then we need a we need a hit counter on the bottom. You are viewer number. 497 to this website. Hey, I still have that on my site. <laughs> Does webcounter.com still work? And then, and then if you can book. also get the best viewed and uh, what, what's the name of your browser now? It's going to be named for that. Oh, right now it's dub, dub, dub. Okay, so this website so, is best viewed the, dub, dub, dub browser, right? So, the worst <laughs> web wrangler. <laughs> <is>. <laughs> oh, TM. Lord. TM, so. okay. So, yeah. okay. right. uh, Karen's asking if we pay more, can we take the blink out? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing I would do, Rick, like because I was fiddling with it when I was doing my little Base 9 mini browser back in the day, is uh, we've got some of the graphics modes sped up enough, like the two color 640 column. You can have all the alternate fonts and stuff, so you can start doing like some of the Isoladdin fonts and the IBM ANSI fonts. You can actually you know, gussy it up a little bit there and, and actually have like you know, bold. It smaller text and all that uh, kind of stuff. Guess, is, that I guess like, the, is that like putting I think lipstick that, on David Ladd when you guess Is that the up? first time we've <laughs> used the word gussy on the show? <laughs> I hope so. That was my could, goal. Could be. Well, gussy that sucker. <laughs> you gotta make it all pretty lad. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, I'm not trying to make a good Basic 09 browser. I'm just trying to block out a web browser and then maybe some of it will end up in Basic 09, but No, just, just for now. So, like the, the one I did, I, I can't remember, did I send you the code for that? It might even be on the yeah, yeah, you did. Um, it's it's had, so like, strange because done, yeah. what what the what the product needs is a memory manager to hide the non FIFO FIFO buffers in the WizNet from the Coco. So if I'm watching the serial stream on the network and I see there is a JPEG image to download, I need really need to tell some browser, okay, you do the dance with the non fifo okay i'm at the end of the buffer i start back at the start of the buffer i write down my finish image blah 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 blah. i need something else to do that so um i don't remember why i started on this conversation but the idea is i'm finding all the problems (laughs) and then it sounds like some fifo 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 fum yeah yeah yeah, it's it's very easy to get started and it's very difficult to finish a job because of the buffer dancing and things that you need to do. Um, so anyway, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out what we don't know right now. And I'm okay. starting to find out a few things. But that's cool. <laughs> You've got a Cocoa website. you got a Cocoa browser. We've got a Cocoa network card. What's the availability on the network cards right now? Is that? Uh, uh, I'm at plus 15. So buy ooh, some, please. <laughs> Can we go to the Cocoa website to check availability of said product and order yes, it's, online it's, through our Cocoa? It is. Com- <laughs> Well, well, no, we can't do that right now. Uh, um, although I'm actually going to just have a site that uh, a page on that site that just links, so you can go there with any web browser. Right. And uh, you know, okay, where do I buy that thing? Well, I'll have a link to my store because you know. Oh, this is <laughs> this is like a Samuel Gimes moment. 
If you mention floppy drives in Gotex long enough, David Ladd will appear. Ladies and gentlemen, David oh, Ladd Jesus. has joined the program. <laughs> Ooh, David. Ooh. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, David. Are you excited to be here, David? Uh, well, I was thinking about going back to sleep, but... <laughs> If you're thinking about going back to sleep, you're in the right place. Oh yeah, yeah. Just want to stay on. Just watch the show a little while longer. Yeah, it's like ambient. Yeah. You'll be out like a light. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, the cloud cover was was uh, thick enough that I thought it was still early morning. So uh, I've been oh, sleeping. Somebody is greeting you by your proper title. Kevin Holloway says hello, Lord of the Floppy. So there you go, David. So, Kevin. Don't don't start with me, otherwise uh, he was, the uh, he was... Christmas party will be canceled on Tuesday. Oh, is Kevin local to you? Yes, he is. He's oh. the vice president of our club. Oh, hey, Kevin. Oh, is I it did... the hair club? I... <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, there's a whole lot of love. I just couldn't yeah. resist that low hanging fruit. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Don't oh, talk yeah. to me about low hanging fruit. We'll fix that for you later. Oh, wow. oh, 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 oh. I'm, oh, mark that now. Being threatened by David Ladd. Oh yes. Oh, my. Watch out, he's a hugger. <laughs> I'm not touching that with a 10-foot motor rod. <laughs> All right. Who else has got an update to share, an acquisition, anything, anyone, anyone, anyone? I was curious I, I, what Rick's website was real quick. Sorry. What is, what is his website? Yeah, it's it's computerconnect.com with one N. Computer I just, I just posted this. At, and you can email Rick, oh, Rick at computerconnect.com. Yep, I just posted this. Across the river from David is what Kevin Holloway says, over the river and Ooh. through the woods. Um, over the river and through the woods to David Lett's house we go. Iowa. Yes, and Sloppy, Iowa. Sloppy Malibu, you said you have an update. Yeah, he's soldering right now. Mute. He's building things. Yes. He's, he's updating. Yes. Hello, Sloppy. Greetings and sanitations. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was uh, in a uh, another Discord, and uh, yes, Marco, dare you. I admit it. I You've was been timing us. I know. Yes, yeah, Marco called me out on it, and I was uh, giving some assistance to someone who needed help with soldering, and they eventually gave up on their soldering and offered me a uh, new little toy uh, for the cost of shipping. So I got a pocket TRS. Okay. If people are not familiar with these things, which probably not, what it is is it uses an ESP32 module dash to emulate. O-1. No, actually, <laughs> dash W R O O M dash E oh, or no okay. B. <laughs> Get it right. Okay. And uh, what it does is it emulates a um, Tandy TRS80 Model Three and Four. Okay. And it has a VGA for uh, the video. Okay. A PS2 uh, monitor. PS2 monitor or PS2 keyboard? PS2 keyboard. Okay. And um, audio in and out. Uh, audio out for sound and audio in for cassette. Cassette, okay. And then uses a micro USB for power. Okay, what's the header back there for? Okay, we're getting to that. Oh, sorry. Going around. <laughs> getting ahead of things. Here. Going around. <laughs> To uh, reset the mo- the machine. Okay. This is for programming the uh, ESP32. Okay. And uh, then we have a another uh, reset for the uh, emulated machine and a reset for this board. And then down here, we have the system bus for the for the Model Three and Model Four. So you can add on anything that you would put into the. Uh, uh, back of the model three and four okay it's like floppy drives even yep you can put a floppy controller on it you can put a uh fred a, a hard drive emulator on it okay or you can even put a real hard drive from a model three or model wow. four on it and what it it, it uh it uh fully emulates it 48k the whole nine and it also uh emulates fred through a window share so you can connect to wi-fi on it 
and then you have a share that it will actually act like a hard drive. Oh, neato. So like an SMB share, that's a shared folder becomes the hard drive that it's accessing. That is correct. Neat. Yep. That is a cool thing. Yes, it is. It takes up a How whole much? lot less space than a typical Model 4 does. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's it called? It, it's called a uh, Pocket TRS. Pocket TRS. Yes. How I, much uh, was it? I got this for the cost of shipping. What do they sell for typically, Ballpark? Uh, it is an open source project, and uh, there isn't a uh, regular seller of them. Oh, you'd have to just... buy all the parts and then flash it yourself with a like a JTAG programmer yeah. or something? Yeah. Well, actually, with a uh, USB to TTL. TTL. And TTL. Yes. RS-232. That was half the problem with this one is the guy didn't uh wasn't able to um flash the chip to be able to use it mm. <laughs> now does um, this have to be soldered together or is it all yes okay so some soldering required um a lot of her soldering required this 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 center here mm -hmm. that is a module that comes as one but everything else on this board has to be soldered okay uh this chip is missing because the person that i got this from their uh, surface mount skills were uh, uh, they were on par like, with a uh, certain like unnamed mine? Curtis. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and he lifted one of the pads, so I have to go through and actually do the full repair before I put the the IC back on. Mm. So, but uh, yeah, I was just talking with the uh, with one of the people that uh, was well, the main developer of this, and uh, he has given me my, his blessings to make them. Oh, neato. Cool. So so you I'm can provide assembled ones that people can just buy from you. Yeah, I'm considering doing that. I just need to uh, talk to the powers that be to see what, what all needs to be done and look into the complete details. Okay, interesting. But, uh, but that yes, looks kind of cool. That looks, that looks really cool. That's, uh, right, yep. yep. That's... And so that TTL, is it doing basically like a hardware-based emulation? So this would be similar to an FPGA type thing, like a Mr. and stuff? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I do believe it's doing software emulation. Mm, okay. Um, because it's, it's not exactly a, uh, okay. But it's still, it's a single board computer. That's pretty compact and, and runs your Trist DOS type type stuff. That's really cool. Right. Um, but it, it, it fully acts like a uh, system. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. I really the, uh, like. I really like it emulates the hardware bus. That's yeah, that's yeah. beauty. Yeah, that that's, you have that. That's a bus true on emulator. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the close. The, yeah, go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. No, I'm going to say no. That's a true emulator. It's like right. you know, stick an MPI into your Raspberry Pi, and uh, right, right, right. There's the, your cocoa. The the closest <laughs> yep. thing I've seen like that in some over the counter retail products is that um, at Games has released some uh, like they they had an Atari 2600 thing that had built in games, but you could put a cartridge in it too, and it would play a, a, a real cartridges on there like their forty dollar emulated Atari, right? Um, and they had one for the Sega Genesis too, where it, you could plug a Genesis cartridge into their little forty dollar, you know, FPGA game game thing to play it. Um, the only problem is that their emulation was slightly off, but it was a neat thing to get something new and cheap that would still have, like kind of retrofit some old real hardware, you know. Yep, and here I'll uh, plug it in so you can see what it looks like. And we've got multiple David Ladd sightings now. David Ladd is on the call. David Ladd was visiting us in. Uh, Twitch, and he's now saying hi on YouTube as well. Hello, David Ladd, and all of your variants and strains. There's a David Ladd variant now? <laughs> yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes, Jason. <laughs> I've been morphed. <laughs> David, David Ladd Om Omicron. Uh, and there it is. There it is. That's beautiful. And it starts up just like a uh, Model 3. And... Will this thing run Donut Dilemma? That's the real test. Like run, like Sailor Man is the 64K test. Donut Dilemma should be the uh, TRS-80 test. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say that uh, getting this thing was to be able to run run uh, the great games of uh, 
a certain <laughs> Nick, but I will not deny that uh, allegation either. Mm -hmm. so, How is it that it works without that one chip being on there? Uh, because that one chip is a uh, interface chip for the uh, bus. Oh, okay. For the uh, what you don't Model right 3 now. 4 bus. So, so you can't bus. plug your uh, expansion right now you can't plug it in. Until that so if I plug in any expansions, they wouldn't work because they're not connected. But 48K, pocket trist yeah. DOS, configure yeah. status, reset settings, help, exit. Wow. Yeah. That's neat. And you can configure it. So um, it's, it's got its own kind of firmware in here. Yep. Show splash and, screen, uh, enable TRS IO. Screen color. Oh, it can it do like green emulation too for the screen? Yes, it can do. Uh oh, I see the password to your Wi Fi. I see the password to your Wi Fi. Cover that up. Right. Cover Are you up. still rocking a 95 Honda? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> and well, you'd have you'd have to be within 100 feet of my house. Hey, to Sloopy's use my neighbors. Sloopy's neighbors. Free Wi Fi password. <laughs> what? Netflix free Wi Fi near Sloopy. <laughs> yeah. So, and can uh, you load? Like can you load a DSK wirelessly? No, it does not. What it does is it doesn't uh, actually uh, emulate a floppy. Oh. It emulates uh, Fred. Which is the hard drive emulation. Which is a hard drive emulation. Yeah. And then you access um, hard drive images on a uh, Samba share, on a Windows share. Hey, it's actually connecting. Can you show us that? SMB yes. connected, yeah. See, connected to the living room. Oh, and it would have had an SD card, too, if you had one, huh? Ooh. So let's configure. I wish you can configure that the, camera uh, to stay in focus. Yeah, yeah. stay focused. Right? That would be nice. Lock yeah. focus. Okay. Couldn't they do this and have a Coco on there? Just the same. There. Okay, now we have Fred. I th I, you probably could. Fred. Fred. Okay, LDOS, LDOS 3, CPM, new DOS 3D, huh? Oh, they have a 3D DOS. You need glasses for that? We've got L Curtis Boyle. They've got L DOS. L DOS. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that is that's is Spanish for the DOS. The DOS. <laughs> <laughs> I see where you were going there. Oh, yes. Ooh, you set him up. Yes. Ooh, you set me up. I'll make the goal. <laughs> Thanks Ooh. for the assist. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's not supposed to reset here. I'm having problems with it. but. Uh -huh. So you're saying it won't load Donut Dilemma right now? <laughs> not at the moment. So oh. it's a proper demo, is what you're yeah. <laughs> yep. Does it have we'll the black? Yeah. Does it have the white screen of death then? Actually, the uh, green doesn't work. So it's although it looks white to you, it's actually a nice shade of purple. Oh. For Ooh. some reason, green is not working. So I think that there's um, the I person that. that uh, chip too. <laughs> yeah, the um, the person who um, who uh, assembled this. Um, I think they messed up the ESP32 module, so what probably the have to get a, ESP. No, yeah, it won't. TTL. It's like when I hit enter on these, they're supposed to be loading whichever one I selected, and instead of it, it's it's resetting. Which I was talking to the developer, and that's what we were working on. And he just sent me a, a new uh, thing to put in there, and that's what i was just trying okay but yeah it's uh it's not working quite right and i'm when uh someone uh sees fit to go out and buy buy a uh drive wire, drive wire. uh listly <laughs> and i'll be able to afford another esp32 unit to put into it and try it out fully so support so, sloopy's habit and buy a drive wirelessly Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Exactly, exactly. I would greatly appreciate it. If you it. act today, we might even throw in a free wire to go with that drive wirelessly as a Can bonus. You act now, we'll throw in a free <laughs> Wi-Fi password. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Sloopy, I got a question. I have um, an answer. So, like, for example, Nick's newest game, Gem Hunter, for the TRS-80s, how would you get that converted over to the hard disk emulator to work he would copy it to his windows pc which is a this which is shared out over the wi-fi um it can run those dsks i would i'm going to put it like this i have never owned a uh model 3 the closest i've owned was a model 4p which i used almost none because i didn't know how to use it didn't understand it 
So I pretty much owned it and that was it. Uh, literally, I did not know about this until about a week. In, I didn't know about the Pocket TRS until about a week and a half ago when someone was asking uh, for some help with soldering. And literally, I've had it since yesterday at 3 p.m. So I don't really know a whole lot about it. And Can you go to basic and type in hello world and all that? Nothing's yes. loading. Oh, it was basic built into ROM? Yeah, basic's built into the ROM. Okay. So... So it, it starts when the uh, yep, yep. when the I/O is not done, and it acts just like a, a Model Three with no uh, yeah, with no you get a ready prompt. <laughs> ready. Yep. Memory size. Don't you have to go to basic or? He's in basic. He's I'm doing in it right basic. Now. Are you yeah. saying? You saying oh, it? I see it. Okay. it uh, that memory size prompt yeah. is how much memory do you want for basic or something like that, and then blop, you're in basic. Isn't it? Okay. Um, Semicolon. How much you want to reserve for uh, for variables? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, you set the size and then blop your in basic, and you have assembly room if you made okay. some. Yeah, so there you go. There's a hello. There one. it is. It's working. It's very cool. Yeah, I mean it does. It works if you have like a a uh, 48k uh, Coco three with no disk drives. This is a very good emulator. <laughs> How about printing? <laughs> Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that he might, have, that might have to be fixed. connected to the headers for the bus. But yeah, yeah, I got to figure out what's wrong with uh, with the, with the machine and uh, why it's not uh, accessing the hard drive like it should. Yeah, I would uh, I would imagine to answer the question though is that if you were going to pull it through an emulated hard yeah. drive, it couldn't be in a disk image. It would have to be the actual binary file that you could just load straight from the. DOS prompt. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to like um, extract it from the disk image, put it in your Samba share, and then pull it that way and run it as a binary. Yeah. Can I uh, share my screen for a quick second? Sure. All right. Uh, let's see here. Screen two. Share. All right. This is my uh, my share for it. And um, <clears throat> archives, if you ignore backup. Random yeah, if you file. ignore the if you ignore the folders, because those are I've been working on it and trying to figure it out. He had just sent me all these files. Well, he sent them to me in a zip so file. Some CMD files, some BAS files. And yeah, he said this is what you need in the uh, in the share to get everything basically running. Donuts there. Yeah. So donut is there. So these are yep. some things that are kind of like in the root of the hard drive that it would like kind of like it's you know, it's boot, it's boot files and stuff. Right. If you had a for Fred on your, uh, on your Coco three or four or one, then this would be the SD card that emulates the hard drive. Right. So the ones that are dot CMD are probably the binary file. So you've got like donut yeah. dot CMD and escape zone dot CMD disassemble yeah. ghost three. So that's, that's the format they'd have to be. You'd have to get them off of a disk image into the actual, like just like a Coco bin file. You'd have to take that bin file and stick it in the Windows share that it would find over the Wi-Fi. Yep. Uh, there you get some ROMs in there, Model 3 Fred ROM, some Fred HD basic boot ROM, Fred ROM. Uh, mm -hmm. Neat. It's a neat idea. It's really cool. Yeah. So. Loopy, how much are you needing to get this off the ground? Um... I've been looking at a little bit of the pricing. I have to make sure for availability of uh, the uh, ICs, but probably somewhere between seventy-five and a hundred dollars, I should be able to uh, make uh, five or ten of them at least. Yeah, if you, you take pre-orders. <laughs> uh, if you want. Yep, sign yeah. me up for one. Yeah. yeah, it's neat. All right. Um, yeah, send me a message on Discord. And let me talk to the person who has sold a couple and how much he regularly sold them for. And I'll go with that as a starting point. And if I can do them for cheaper, then I'll, I'll do refunds. And if not, then I'll, I'll uh, say, Hey, is this much more or whatever. Hey, before you're done sharing your screen, is there any more of your personally identifying information you'd like to share with the world? Any more passwords, credit card numbers, last four of your social? Yeah, yeah we well, just I'm, need the number on the back, that three-digit number. Yeah, that, right, right. Oh, that is 138. 
All right. <laughs> you just have to figure out which card it's for. Right, okay. right. Get shit from it. <laughs> Unless it's Amex, which is thoughtfully put the verify number on the front along with the credit card number. So. Yeah. I mean, literally, what are you going to get? I have... Uh, I have four dollars, or no, I have six dollars in my uh, in my PayPal, which Ooh. I was going to send to this guy for this, and he said, "Don't worry about it. He's going to have me do work for him instead." Well, David Ladd can so, get a snack at Taco Bell with that. <laughs> Not a full meal, but a snack. Get that five. <laughs> they got that five dollar box deal you can get at Taco <laughs> Bell. There you go. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Well, that's so, cool, Sloopy. Thanks for sharing that. We yep. look forward to seeing how that project goes. There's got to be a way now to somehow connect that to drive wirelessly as well, where the Coco and the Tris can talk to each other wirelessly somehow through the Bitmanger. That's your next project. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay. No pressure. Just have it done by next Saturday. Right. Show. You're yeah. doing All both right. of them, so just, 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 make it a, just make it a Christmas Pardon? miracle. <laughs> hardware is done now you just need to get someone to do software there you go well, <laughs> Isn't that always the case okay anybody else have a project update acquisition something they'd like to share Any no you do but i, I got a brief i got a very brief one very it's boring but we'll, Ooh, i can bring it up real quick yes Ooh, I'll pick kind of a, uh, it's a, it's very brief it's a it's a uh, it's an early christmas present and i i'm using it right now Get out of and so since I'm using it, it's a little hard to show it, but I have the box. But uh, the lovely Sarah as an early Christmas present since uh, having some lighting issues, got me a uh, ring light and you can see oh. the re reflection oh. of the ring. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, and cool. it's got the little it's got the little uh, remote. Uh, there we go. Oh, the remote control. Clicker. It's got a clicker. I've got it's got a clicker. It's USB powered. Ooh. It's on a it's on a little stand here. It, it, you know, wow. you got 28, 46, or 63 inches. And wow. um, wait, and how you, much would you, you know, pay? how much would you pay? Don't answer yet. I, and I don't have any personally <laughs> identifiable information on here. <laughs> but I, I can I can go through the three colors. It has three colors and oh, ten Lord, brightness yeah. level. Count them wow. ten. Oh, oh, there's look a, at that. that. Now we've gone to natural lighting. <laughs> yes. Now, now like we've gone to like the yeah, it's like ugh. And and then the we, yellow light. Like, there's the white light. Yeah. And then there's the white the light, and there's the. Uh, that's where yeah, that's kind of where I was at before. And then I have the. So yeah. Uh, it's just a wired oh wired remote control here. Now, what the, what's what's the, the purpose oh. of it? Well, it's well. Let's see. It Here's the purpose it, of it, Ron. Let me shut it off. Look, he's in the dark. That's yeah, a good purpose. That's yes. better. Yeah, this is probably yeah. an improvement <laughs> to some some people, dark, yes. but that, that you're just going to have to live with. Oh, they've got porn orange and. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now, there, I, it, it, I, now I challenge you. I challenge you to upgrade this by putting a toggle switch on it. Well, it's, <laughs> it's already yeah. it already has four push button switches. Yeah, but it's not a it's not a Coco Man product without a toggle switch. Come on. Well, it does have a USB. I could. I guess I could put a USB. <laughs> or could could we at least switch. could we at least upgrade it to work with the clapper so we can. Clap off. Clap, her. <laughs> Clap off. Oh, every every time there's a loud noise, it just shuts off. Yeah, yeah that right. that sounds great. <laughs> that's that. That's it. But it's it's very helpful. It's on a stand. It's right here. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Sarah, the lovely and talented Sarah. Always thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um. Anybody else? Project update, acquisition. Anyone? 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 All right. I have one thing to show that I did acquire, which I showed um, uh, briefly when David Lent was on, which I, he had to leave. But um, I actually got this a couple weeks ago, but every now and then I go into a, um, a pen and paper a board game store that's uh, somewhat local to me. And, they, and, and they've been remaking a lot of the um, Dungeons and Dragons books now, too. And like the box sets, I remember I used to, I have to, I had the box sets, the blue box. The red box was the basic set. The blue box was the advanced set. And this was like, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. That wasn't the advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And then there was another board game, which I still have somewhere in my garage, that was called Dungeon. And it folded out and kind of had like a Monopoly board and little plastic tokens. And you moved them around the dungeon and you rolled dice and you pulled up monster cards and fought monsters and got treasure. And so I saw that they had... Um, I saw they had the reproductions of the boxed sets of Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, man, I really wish they would reproduce that game Dungeon because mine's in really bad shape and it was a cool board game and I wish they had it. And a guy walks over and goes, oh, yeah, we got one right here. I think this is it. And so I went and I looked at it. And so this is the, new, um, the newly produced version of the game Dungeon, which is basically um, a board game 
that has like the the floor plan of you being in a dungeon and you can be one of four characters and each character has different strengths so you have to go to different levels that have harder monsters but have more treasure and the goal is to reach a certain amount of gold if you're like a level one low character you've got to get a thousand gold if you're a strong character you got to get like ten thousand gold or whatever it is but you run around slaying monsters uh, gaining gaining points until you reach your um, point value you have to get and then you have to make your way back to the start um, so it's a really cool um, game that I and I still have my version in the garage the box has deteriorated but the one thing I did to my version of the game was that I, I actually had modified the rules and I'd changed some of the monster cards and I did some few things and when I did that being a dumb kid not thinking that I would still have this 40 years later I actually used Elmer's glue and I taped on my new stats for the cards on top of the old cards and so my upgraded version of the game now has zero collectability and and lots of shame um, uh, associated with it so um, but I'm glad I have kind of a new um, version of this. So um, one of these days, I'll, I'll I, my video will not look anywhere near as good as any of Terry Steggy's. So this is like trying to put lipstick on a pig, trying to do one of my videos. But maybe I will do uh, setting this thing up and showing you what this one looks like compared to the old one or something like that. I might do something like that. But it, it's a it was a cool game. It's something you can play of two to four players, and you roll dice and you move little pawns around the screen, and it's a fantasy theme type game. So. Uh, so that was something I got Ooh. a little while ago. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to show off, but I was hoping um, I did put this in Discord and I gave um, stuff to a few people to try. But I had mentioned, um, I, I mentioned, I've been I've been talking about this for a while, and then I mentioned it in an interview I did with uh, David Lent, and then I mentioned I think a week or so ago I wanted to work on this text adventure game engine. And I, I, I got as far as doing kind of a mock-up screen where I showed you just a fake screen of what the game might look like. And then I took that one step further and I created some mock-up rooms and I have kind of a playable demo that you can navigate through a handful of screens. And I put that on the um, Interactive Fiction channel on Discord. There's a zip file you can get and you can download. And I've got two binaries. I've got a Windows binary and a Mac OS binary where you can try it out. Um, and so I had asked a few people to try it before the show just to, to look at it and give me your opinion. So I don't know if anybody, I think the only person I know who did for sure was Alan Murphy. I'm not sure if his microphone is on or not. Um, but it, I, I thought I, I would just, and I'm not looking for somebody to stroke my ego. I'm just more looking for feedback and opinion. And if you guys want me to show it on the show, I can dare that. I can do that too. But um, Alan, did you get a chance? To, you did look at it a little bit, right? Yeah, I went through the uh, yeah, entire first version that you sent me. We validated that it worked under Wine on Linux. And okay. uh, uh, <clears throat> after the entrance, I went east instead of west and uh, managed to trap myself in the attic. Okay. And then uh, went back and went to the west and saw the Room of Horror. Ah, uh, yes. And the, no spoilers on that, but yes, there are... Um, there are truly horrific things to see and find in the, even the 10 room demo. Yeah, yeah. So I started by just like mocking up the screen to say, what would the screen look like? And then I'm and like, all right, well, let me take it the, one step further. Everything worked. Um, it was reasonably easy to navigate because it's built around a hotkey system for, um, for your most common things. So it, it's somewhere I mean, it's easier to navigate than Daggereth, that's for sure. You just hit N for North and that kind of thing. Right. Um, and that may change over time. And I mentioned this to Rick, too, Rick Eulen at, at Cocoa Fest, that I wanted to work on this. And and so while I'm, I'm doing this in Quick Basic because it's just easy for me to develop. And the bottom line is is that this it's quick, I can it's quick and you can run it on a real computer. You don't have to run an emulator. So it's still a vintage retro project, but it's going to run on a modern computer and uh, so you don't have to fire up an emulator to play it. However, because I am writing it in BASIC, it should be easy enough to port to BASIC 09, but I don't want to be bothered with yes. having to learn and develop yes. for BASIC 09 right now. But no. once, once I have the engine, as I have some releasable versions of the engine, I'll be happy to give the source code to Rick to let him convert it to BASIC 09 for me. Challenge accepted. I can get quick BASIC into BASIC 09, no problem. Yeah, yeah And you can yeah. put it online on your web. Page yeah, we can put on your. Oh, right. So, yeah, yeah, I'll have the online so, version. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the, so I'll just go ahead and I, I guess I'll just fire it up then, and let's see if it comes up in the uh, stream. Um, I'm not sure if it will. Let me bring it over here, onto this window, and then tell me if you can see it. Can you guys see it uh, in the? Um, I, I'm not sharing Zoom right now, so I don't think you can. Hold on one second. 
Um, let me get out of it and let me try this again. Uh, I think I have to share screen share Zoom with you guys. All right. Okay. All right. So let me try it again. All right. Alt Enter. Let's get it out of full screen. Let's get over here where you can see it on that screen. Let me get OBS open back up again. Let me go back to full screen. All right. So can you guys, we, all right, can you see it now in the Zoom? Yep. Okay. So you can see the full screen. So um, my some a lot of the inspiration for this came from, um, oh, shit, where did it go? Jesus <laughs> H. Christ. All right. Let me minimize that. All right. Can you guys still see it now? Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, some of the inspiration for this came from stuff that we've been doing in the news um, where Curtis was showing all these really cool games like on the Dragon where they took the adventure game idea and they just kind of changed it up where you had some static stuff on the screen. And I said, I really like that idea. I like the idea of, you know, why should we have to keep typing in the word look every time to remind us what's on the screen? Why should I have to keep typing in inventory to see what's in my inventory? What if I just had that stuff on the screen and it doesn't change so you can just focus on what you need to do? Like I can now just the where I'm at is always there. You know, so that was so part of the inspiration was just taking the concept and just making it less having to repeat and refresh some of that information. Right. So in this case, you've kind of got a static screen and I've got it broken into different areas. So the top section here, you kind of see the room description whatever directions are, are available will be there in red. If there are items in the room, that's going to be there, what your inventory is. And then the bottom is where you're going to type in your commands, right? So this is the first version of what the screen layout will be. This may change over time as the needs change. Um, it's kind of working in an MS dos looking screen. So it's 80 by 25, which means that should work very well for the Coco. Pretty, pretty close to that anyways, right? So um, and so in the first, you just start off with an introduction, which kind of explains that. And, and I've, I've created a room that doesn't do anything. So this is technically a room and this room is just a description. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. And then I can just hit enter again to go to another room. I have to, am I clicking on that one? All right. And then if I just hit enter again, so now I'm going to another room, it says, this is an example. So my idea of the interactive fiction is I want to have some fiction in here too where we can do some storytelling where it's not just always going from room to room but I have the ability to bring up pages of information where I can create narrative or explain a scene or do things like that so that's kind of built into the engine so you can have a screen that's not really a room it's just a screen uh, that has information and you can have as many of those go to as many of those as you want right um, so this, so the first two screens are information screens. And then when you hit enter again, now you're into the game, right? And so I created this small little, um, world to explore. It's just a small house, so to speak. So you see, now we're at it's the main not, entrance. Yeah. It's not updating the screen. It's not updating. Yeah. Hmm. How do I fix that? It's not updating that on, I wonder if I'm, I, I think I can't have it. Um, I can't have it full screen then for some reason. Can you see it now? You can see it now, yeah. but it's super small, right? Yeah. Hmm. If I do it now and I click on it. All right. I can see that. Okay. Do you see where you say you find yourself at the entrance to the Grand Manor? Yeah. Right. And so then what you see here is that you see that the direction says north, right? So. Um, so the word north is there. So whenever you're in a room, you'll see what are available. You don't have to keep typing in look to remind yourself. So that was kind of the idea. Have the pertinent information always on screen. Oh, so one of the things we're seeing here is they're saying the top is cut off. And the reason why that's cut off is because I have that because Zoom typically has information there that's cut off. So yeah, the top is a status line that kind of tells you the name of your location, right? So I don't know if I, if I hit north again and I'm in here. Yeah, it's not updating. So I think I have to click on and click on again. Uh, you find yourself in the grand hall of the manor. Um, yeah. So anyways, this is a playable demo. And you can just right now, I'm not even having you type in commands because this is literally just a demo. You can just hit N for north, S for south, U for up, D for down. And so you can kind of run around the world by pressing a single key right now. That might change over time. But the idea is, is as I'm working on figuring out the logic to the, um, 
to the game engine and the tables and all that kind of stuff, um, I, I figured I just needed to make something that was kind of a proof of concept. So if anybody wants to look at this, it is um, on Discord. If you go under the game section and under interactive fiction, there's a zip file there right now that has this particular version. And this version is slightly fixed over the one that you saw, Alan, um, where you can now get down from the attic and in that one room you can now go um, west again or east or whatever it was where it couldn't before because I forgot to put that in the table, right? Um, so this will continue to evolve and, and right now I'm going to just be doing some hard-coded stuff to work out the data structures and the logic and how I want to do things. But uh, eventually once I get all that stuff figured out, I figured rather than me having to, to write all the stuff into a program, I'm doing this for me and the benefit is other people could use it too, but I'm going to end up creating like a, a level editor where you can build out your adventure screen by screen with a separate program, save that out as a data file. And then the engine is just going to be like the interpreter that will take that file and run the game. So the idea is, is this adventure game engine, you, anybody can take my other tool and build your own adventures and run in there. Um, and, and I'm doing that for me to make it easier for me to make the games rather than having to type it all in as a code, right? So, um, yeah, but we can have a game on challenge where you design the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, th <laughs> but ideally this could be, um, a game on challenge. Once we, once we've got a, a, an adventure game that's finished by somebody, we can make that the game of the week, right? Where we can play that adventure. Um, but there's a lot of things I got to figure out on on stuff. So right now I've got the, the the logic and the data figured out where you can navigate room by room by room, and the room logic works, and you can map the rooms, and they work to where you need to go. Um, I need to figure out um, how to place objects in the world and make the objects work in a location versus in your inventory. I want to have um, I want to have other things like a hidden door that you won't know until you search the wall and then there's going to be a hidden door and I want to have doors with conditions like is the door open, is it closed, is it just a doorway I can walk through, is it a locked door that's going to require a key. So there's going to be a lot of things that, that I want to add to it, but I, I need to start simple and just get certain things. So I feel within, you know, probably before the end of this year, I can have a very simple um, adventure game engine that's just kind of like what we had on the Coco, just two word parsing walking through locations and being able to pick up and drop items at different locations. I just got to figure out how can I determine what the end game is? What's the goal? Do I have to reach a certain score? Do I need to make a certain spot? Like, do I need to find the exit to the maze? Things like that. So those are all the things I got to figure out how to do programmatically and then make that part of a generic engine that you can, people can design different games that all have different ways to win, you know, um, using the same engine. So that, that's where some of the challenge is going to come in is to build in all these conditions and stuff. Um, and I'm just going to be figuring that stuff out one problem at a time. <laughs> so anyways, that's that. So if you want to check it out, it's in Discord. It's in the under the game category under uh, interactive fiction. All right. And that's it. And then so if you check it out, give me some feedback. And the other thing that I don't that I can't test because I'm, 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 I'm compiling versions on my Mac and, and the binary, I'm, I'm pretty sure it does work, but I've never had somebody else try that binary on a Mac OS that isn't part of my computer because I know I had to install something else in my Mac to get the compiler to work. And I don't know if there's a missing runtime library that might be that might be needed by somebody else. So I'd really like somebody who's got a Mac OS to also look at that zip file and try that binary on a Mac and see. Um, and, and it has to be an x86 Mac. I don't know if it's going to. Well, maybe the M1 would do it through uh, Rosetta. Rosetta 2. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd like somebody to try the Mac one. And then I'm also going to, and now the other things too, is I'll be able to make a version of this for the Cocoa Pie, because the Raspberry Pi, because uh, Ron Klein already put um, QB64 on there specifically because I told him a year ago I was going to do this at some point in time. So QB64 has been on the Cocoa Pie forever. So I'll be able to make Cocoa Pie versions of this. And I can do a Linux version too. I just don't have a Linux machine. So I'm probably going to have to build a VM with Ubuntu and be able to figure out how to make Linux binaries too and have people test hey, that Stevie, for me. Yeah. If you have Windows 10, it does have the uh, Unix subsystem in it that's based I on Ubuntu. I don't want to deal with that. I'd rather build a virtual machine. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why. In my brain, I'd rather keep it in a box and not try to complicate my operating system because I don't know if I can handle that concept. So, But good to know. Good to know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll learn myself up on that one. Um, 
Yes. Anyway, so that's my update and uh, whatever. Look forward to some feedback on that. Uh, anything else? Anybody got anything else they want to share? That, that looks really cool. I'm excited to download it and try it. Give it a shot. Yeah. Mm. And um, there are some Easter eggs in my little demo world that I created. So there are some things that may or may not be <laughs> noticeable to people who have been around this community and this show for a while. So I've got some maybe not so hidden humor in there, but we'll have to see if you find it. Uh, and uh, if nobody has anything else to say right now, what I will do is um, I will go ahead and run the outro and then give us a chance to do parting thoughts. But before I do that, does anybody have anything else they want to say, share, remind us of events? Did you want to remind us of uh, the boat fest or anything like that, Curtis, or too soon? Or No, we've kind of mentioned it before. It's a general retro show. It'll be in June. Um, okay. We'll get boat on to do another plug for it a little bit later all right so then i'll run the outro and then we'll come back for parting thoughts this concludes another episode of cobra talk the wedding live talk show featuring the tandy color computer mc10 and dragon systems for all things cocoa talk visit us on the web at cocotalk.live we'd love to hear from you send feedback suggestions even segments via email to cocoa talk at cocotalk.live Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, click on the Patreon link on our website, cocotalk.live. Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, crew, and contributors. Thanks go to Alan Murphy, Amigos Retro Gaming, Bill Noble, Brian Joyce, Brian Weaver, Curtis Boyle, D. Bruce Moore, Danny O'Connor, David Lang, Eric Canales, George Jansen, Grant Leedy, James Diffendapper, Jason Reichert, Jim Brain, Ken Reichert, Ken Waters, Mark Bosley, Mark Overholzer, Mikey Furman, Mr. Dave6309, Nick Morentes, Nick Morota, Nick Morota, Nick Morota, Paul Fiscarelli, Richard Lorbieski, Rick Adams, Rick Ulin, Rob Inman, Ron Delvaux, Samuel Gimes, Sloopy Malibu, Steve Bjork, Terry Steggy, Tom C., and many, many more. Please help support the Coco community. A list of various contributors and resources are available at imacoconut.com. That's I-M-A-C-O-C-O-N-U-T dot com. The original Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Sheeler. The new Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2020 by D. Bruce Moore. Both are mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. Coco forever! Yeah, I'm hearing some real stuttery sounds on my audio. This is the first time I'm trying to stream this show from a different computer. Maybe it just hasn't had a chance to buffer things yet. I don't know. So some things to work out there. It's the playback, though, on the pre-recorded stuff, not your voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I voice just, was crackly earlier, but it's uh, it's settled down. Settle down now. Simmer down now. Uh, all right, so we're back. We have some happy holidays. So Tom Eric Gunderson saying Merry Christmas. Don't forget to send us um, send us some segments that we can air with a little community montage, if you will. Uh, so Tom Eric Gunderson saying uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Um, Canadian Retro Things, Merry Christmas, Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, uh, Happy Kwanzaa, uh, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Festivus for the rest of us. All those good things, right? Um, and what else? Anything else? Anything we didn't mention? Oh, uh, upcoming speakers. Do we want to do that? And so at least one of them that I know we're going to have in the near future, which we probably should plug. Uh, that would be, uh, who is that? We're going to look at our, uh, Coco Talk interviews. I put that in a Google calendar. So we have David Lent today. Thank you, David, for being here. And then who do we have coming up potentially, possibly, as future speakers? Um, uh, are we still good for Stephen Goodwin on January 8th, Curtis? 
Last I heard, yes, all of these are still okay. Still a go. And do we want to remind people who Stephen Goodwin is, or was, or shall be? Or... Oh, you put me on the spot here. I can't okay, remember. never mind. All right. No one do that. <laughs> but uh, we, then we have some game developing brothers. We have two sets uh, of them: Doug and Kevin Leaney, and Paul and Tim Thayer will be on January the fifteenth. So that's two sets of brothers who designed Coco Games back in the day and are designing them today. And then um, on January 22nd, which also happens to be my brother's birthday, we're having Randy Kindig, who is the host of the Floppy Days podcast, will be our special guest on January 22nd. Randy Kindig is kind of like the godfather of retro podcasts. He's been doing it for a long time, very well respected, and he decided to come on this show anyways. So um, I'm yeah, looking forward to that. And Scott Griefen in the first week of February, too. So Yes. Yeah, so... Um, and, and, and when when I saw Randy at VCF Midwest in September, I'm going, Randy, man, because I, I told him because he had recorded a bumper for me years ago that he forgot about, and I play his bumper. I go, Randy, you know, I play your bumper all the time. He goes, Did I record a bumper for you? I'm like, Yeah, man. I go, You know, I told, and I said, I said it verbatim because I know, it, like, Hey, this is Randy Kindig from the Floppy Days podcast, and I just love me some Coco, and no one does it better than Stevie Stroh. You're listening to Coco Talk because I just love. He's so smooth, you know. And he's like, oh, I forgot. I go, dude, you want to come on the show? He's like, oh, I'd love to come on the show. I go, well, we'd love to have you. And he's like, you know what? He goes, you know, I've interviewed just about every other podcaster on the planet. And not once has any of them ever asked to interview me. So you'll be the first <laughs> people who've ever interviewed me. And I'm like, well, that's an honor then. I'm happy to have you. So, um, yeah, if you guys don't know the Floppy Days podcast, it's been around for years. Uh, he typically will focus on... Uh, um, you know, systems by decades and things like that. So one month they'll go over, you know, and, and each one focuses on one thing. Um, and he's managed to do a lot of different interviews along the way. So Randy's been doing uh, vintage computing podcasting for, for years. And uh, he also was, is associated with the, um, the Antic podcast, which is an Atari podcast. And then he's also a part of the TRS-80 Trash Talkers as well. And, and uh, is one of the guys who runs the uh, Tandy Assembly show. So should be able to hear some interesting things about Randy and all the stuff that he's done and, and his years of doing vintage computing podcasts and events and festivals and stuff. So that should be pretty cool. On uh, January 22nd, we'll have that interview. Live. We'll do it live. Uh, all right. Anything else? No. I'll take the awkward silence as a no. Okay. Well, then, thank And we have David Lab. Speaking of celebrities and, and uh, icons in the uh, in the retro world, David Ladd is with us today. We're very lucky to have Lord of the Floppy, David Ladd. Thank you for coming, no, David. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rick Euland. I'm looking forward to seeing more Coco web browsing. Terry Steggy with his phenomenally produced video content. Just raising the bar. I mean, typically we, we tend to trip over the bar on this show, but Terry's, we have to reach up and try to grab that bar that he has raised. So thank you, Terry, for doing that. And uh, Ken Waters of Canadian Retro Thanks. Thank you for your Game On segment every week. We appreciate you. L. Curtis Boyle. Eh. Uh. <laughs> just, yeah. I just want to mention uh, the, the uh, other interview for the beginning of January on January 8th. Steve Goodwin, he's the author of the upcoming book, 20 Go to 10, which is a retro oh, computer okay, history we got book him with in. all the different yes. numbers associated with okay. various Okay, yeah. yeah. He's got that computers. new book that he's doing right now. Yeah. Um, and he was at Dragon Talk. What date is that? That's January the 8th. January the 8th. Stephen Goodwin has got a new book right now, 20 Go to 10, or is it 10 Go to 20? Is it? 20 go to 10. 20 go to 10. All right. And there's some numeric significance to the name of the book and how information is presented. Alan Murphy, thank you for all you do. A lot of behind the scenes stuff. Sleepy Malibu, um, great guy in the community and also is our weekly Game On live interactive session going. Mark Overholzer, thank you for being here. Bye. Mark B, thanks for being here as a backup just in case my thing bit the bullet, which it didn't. I'm Stevie Stroh. Say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Just see you next year, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, right. we'll try to do something Christmas time. Keep on Discord. And, and uh, don't forget, send us some content so we can throw out a little community slideshow from you guys if you can. Take care. 8-Bits in the Basement was here. Thanks. Bye-bye. I David guess Kraker. the key word was broadcastable. Broadcastable.